uh, which is organized by Department of History and Ancient Indian Culture of Dr. Babu Sahab Ambedkar Marathwada University, Aurangabad, Maharashtra, India, in association with Welcome Trust UK and Rural South Asia. Today is the third day of our seminar, and um, already in the past two days, we had some very interesting discussions, which were done by scholars from different parts of the world. On the day one, we had Dr. Maria Luisa Weissaga and Miguel, Dr. Miguel Reyes Contreras from the American continents, from FIU Miami and Mexico City. On uh, yesterday, we had uh, even more wider discussions on different aspects of indigeneity and health systems, where Dr. Titi Patel of Soul Seva Foundation, Dr. Tilly Jacob from OSU, Oklahoma, Dr. Professor Jean Tinney from Black History Movement of Miami, and Dr. Jayanta Bhattacharya from Raiganj, West Bengal spoke about different issues pertaining to health systems and pandemic. Today is the third day of our uh, seminar and uh, the uh, generic theme of the uh, today's panel is 21st century pandemic and global first uh, and pandemic and global first response of the indigenity. The three distinguished speakers for today are Dr. Jimmy, uh, sorry, the four distinguished speakers for today are Mr. Jimmy Lee Beeson II of uh, Haskell Indian Nation University, Lawrence, Kansas. Mr. Roshi Maybach uh, from Stellenbosch University, South Africa, and presently working in Turkey. We have Dr. Uh, Mr. Firoz Barothev, uh, who is, at, uh, who is uh, a former employee of Tajik, uh, former senior reporter of Tajikistan Media of Tajikistan, and presently working with New York, and also being an uh, outstation or the far distant reporter for the Tajikistan media. And we have Dr. Unkar Mittal, who is of Sudeshin, who has a first-hand experience of working with the indigenous communities in different parts of South Asia. I'll be in detail, they are talking about, and for today's um, panelist, the discussion for today's panelist is Dr. Hari Priya Narsiman. Uh, she's an anthropologist and works on medical anthropology. So, Dr. Nari Haripriya Nasiman, she will be. She's from IIT Hyderabad, uh, India, and she will be discussing. I'll be reading uh, now uh, the short bio and title of Professor Dr. Jimmy, um, uh, Mr. Jimmy Nibisi of Haskell Indian Nation University. And as we will proceed for each of the presenter, I'll be reading. Uh, I'll be uh, discussing about their short bio. So, uh, before inviting Dr. Uh, Mr. Jimmy Nibisi. Two of Haskell, uh, he's professor of masters in social work, masters in social work at Haskell Indian Nation University of Lawrence, Kansas. His short, uh, his short bag, um, bio reads as follows: uh, Jimmy Lee Beeson II uh, is a Native American of Osage Nation of Eagle Clan. He's a faculty member in the Indigenous and American Indian uh, Studies Department and at Haskell Indian Nations University. Uh, he's instructing courses such as theories of decolonization and indigenization, concepts of indigenous leadership, community health in indigenous communities, and American Indian issues. He has a history of advocacy and community organizing to bring awareness and education to Native issues through speaking, lecturing, writing, along with advocating a return to traditional values to counter the process of colonization. Uh, Dr. Um, Jimmy has a huge impact through his Instagram profile among many Native American uh, young scholars, as well as the leading uh, leaders of, as well of the American Indian Society at present. So um, we welcome um, the Mr. Jimmy Lee Beeson for his presentation. The title for his presentation is Impact and Response to Pandemic in Native American Communities. So we welcome Dr. Be uh, Mr. Beeson, please come on dais and start your presentation. Uh, Mr. Beeson, you can come and uh, I think now you can open your uh, microphone as well as video camera as well. Mr. Beeson, you're there? Hi. Yeah, can hi. You hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can, can you, you open me? your. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, we Thank can. you. We can hear you. I can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, can you come? Uh, can you put your camera on? Yes, perfect. Please, sir, begin your, begin your presentation. 
Okay, you're, I think, okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh. hi, Vina. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so with my presentation, it's mainly about um, um, how in indigenous communities, native communities uh, responded um, during the process of colonization and okay i think your um, video is freezing so you can um, you can only put your presentation and uh, you can keep your microphone on okay all right <laughs> Yeah, I think that would be that would make things easier because your presentation is there, so uh, you can keep your. Um, um, oh, I'm some... sorry. If you'll keep your uh, camera off, you cannot show your presentation. Yeah, yeah. So you have to keep your camera on, otherwise you won't be able to show your presentation. Yes. Um, can you see my presentation? Yeah, you can start speaking. Yes, we can see your presentation. Now you can um, begin to speak so that we can hear you also. Okay. Are you okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, so sure. during okay. colonization, um, there was intentional and unintentional um, uh, let's see. So during colonization, there was a um, intent. Intentional and unintentional. Uh, um, smallpox was given as a used as a biological cool weapon. Um, towards native people uh, so that the. Uh, resistance of native people wouldn't be as strong. And so eventually um, different communities, native communities had to uh, start responding to judges and start uh, doing social distancing like we are now. Um, a lot of times they can care for and they would leave the, the village, the people would leave the villages, uh, sick people, and uh, so they could survive. And most of the times, um, whole populations were uh, killed from these uh, diseases such as smallpox uh, the and even smallpox returned in 1901 uh, the dole uh, who is suffering from smallpox an outbreak that occurred in 1901 and there was some uh, uh, documentation of on the ho chunk reservation in Wisconsin of smallpox outbreak again. <clears throat> so during that time, uh, these diseases help facilitate the process of colonization. And, um, and it's theorized that the Spanish may have brought the first cases of smallpox uh, in the 1500s. Uh, by the time the, the British came and eventually they became you know, of course, the Americans, um, a lot of times they weren't encountering Native communities at their full strength because a lot of them had already been uh, decimated by these diseases. Um, so resistance was very, wasn't as strong as it could have been to colonization. And um, so, and then today, we see uh, um, the same 
kind of response uh, towards these disease, towards uh, COVID-19 as back, uh, you know, in the last, during the process of colonization in the first 400 years. Um, so right here, is, there's a picture of the uh, Cheyenne River Sioux Nation uh, conducting a checkpoint, keeping out um, motorists who are traveling through their land to prevent the spread of COVID. And um, so, but the state of South Dakota has been infringing on the sovereign rights of uh, the Cheyenne River Sioux and telling them what they're doing is illegal, but they're still doing it. And they have now sued the um, the state of South Dakota and basically to protect their people who are possibly spreading COVID-19. And um, Native communities are at higher risk for COVID-19 or possibly dying from COVID-19 uh, because of um, underlying health factors uh, such as asthma, diabetes, obesity, um, and uh, heart disease, and most of these underlying uh, factors, underlying risks, ha are pretty much the legacy of colonization. So, because after colonization, um, Native people were forced on, of course, forced on reservations, and diets were restricted, um, where they used to basically hunt for Uh, buffalo and uh, animals who had a uh, um, better, uh, healthier um, aspects, they uh, um, had to re become reliant on government commodities that weren't very healthy. And at the same time, um, what a lot of people don't know is that because of the treaties made with native nations and uh, between the government, they are supposed to, the government is supposed to uh, um, uh, provide health funding for native communities, but they don't, don't provide enough. And there's this um, gap in financial uh, resources for native communities um, that lends to a lot of the health issues and most native communities are dealing with um, income. A lot of native communities are being hit hard. Um, also basically for the fact that uh, native people um, have a lower life expectancy than white Americans. So when COVID-19 is getting into the community, um, uh, that's there's already been a lot of uh, death from it, uh, particularly in the Navajo Nation. Um, one of our family friends, his uh, wife is Navajo, and uh, her mother just passed away, um, I think yesterday or a couple of days ago from COVID-19. And actually, those same people, our friends um, in Kansas City, they got they contracted COVID-19. And they had a really hard time recovering also because of underlying health um, issues. Um, and down in our communities in, uh, um, in Oklahoma, there's been an increase in COVID-19. Also, because a lot of people aren't. Um, doing serious social distancing and things like that. And there's there's been a change too in the way traditions have been um, done. Hold on. 
So is it all right if I click out of the PowerPoint? Uh, you want to switch it off? Uh, your PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah, you just have to stop sharing. Yeah, because I'm going to go ahead and just... Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, please. Go. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so basically, that was just um, kind of a quick overview of the way that uh, we've been dealing with um, pandemics before. Um, like I said, these when colonization was occurring, um, Native communities were hit pretty hard due to an, a lack of immunity. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, COVID-19 is hitting as hard um, due to a lack of, uh, you know, uh, almost like a lack of pre-existing um, health, the health conditions of our people are mm -hmm. uh, already bad. So when COVID-19 is hits, um, that's also lending to the higher death rates and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Also, because there isn't a lot, there hasn't been a lot which is provided for the Native community, um, mm -hmm. even though treaties are supposed to be based on the treaties between Native nations and the U.S. government. They're supposed to be providing. Uh, health resources, resources, uh, staff, and um, medical expertise and equipment to deal with a lot of these things. And it, it really has an impact. And also on the uh, um, our traditional uh, teachings, traditional ceremonies, those have been impacted because um, like things like a sweat lodge or uh, Sundance or ceremonies, a lot of those were canceled because mm -hmm. they're trying to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, so a lot of the question is like, what do we do to, uh, how do we adjust to this new reality where ceremonies and gatherings that usually another and uh, sharing spaces, we are now having to uh, basically not do that. Um, in my own personal experience here in Lawrence, uh, we have a community of traditional native uh, people. And we go, uh, when we went to a sweat lodge, uh, Nipi ceremony, um, we all had to, we basically were like talking with each other and we were like asking each other, what, what should we be doing to make sure we're not spreading it or to take precautions. So basically we, uh, we only allowed like three or four people and we, we didn't notify a lot of people about um, the ceremony. So, and then, Traditionally, uh, usually when we, uh, after the ceremony, we share um, in praying with a, a sacred pipe and then everyone smokes it. Mm -hmm. And we, so we didn't, we made adjustments, but we didn't share, share it. We just smoked our own pipes and we, um, we didn't share it. So that was a big change. That was, uh, um, you know, that we hadn't done before. So it's just all these little things that, you know, and usually we share water, like we pass around water in the same cup. Uh, um, and we didn't do that. And we started talking about, we have to bring our, we should bring our own water. So we're still trying to uh, practice our traditions, but they are um, definitely changed and altered. So we're not sharing, um, you know, possibly spreading anything. And even back home in Oklahoma, our uh, um, Sundance 
uh, that is uh, ran by my adopted dad, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Larry Sellers, whom uh, Bina got to meet uh, when she was. He, we, he, they made the decision to cancel um, also because there's a lot of elderly people who show up to the Sundance. Um, at first, we were going to have it and then take precautions and then um, Trump had his rally in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. uh, Oklahoma and that um, um, so I'm the sun, you know, there, so earlier in the summer and, um, so the decision was made to cancel the Sundance. Um, but interestingly enough, there are, there are some communities in, in the North who, uh, still had the Sundance or certain ceremonies are still happening. And, um, but I'm not sure what the impact what the implications of that are yet. Cause, um, you know, again, there isn't a lot of media coverage in our communities. And, um, so it'd be interesting to see if people were affected or impacted or got sick. From ceremonies that were still taking place. I think the question is with our communities, when it comes to tradition and, you know, things that we do um, that are very social in nature, things like powwows. Um, the question is, like, how do we move from here? You know, even if they have a vaccine, that's still no guarantee that, you know, um, that, you know, because it's, it's hard to know what to, uh, to do in this situation. And I feel kind of like we're back in a place where our ancestors were when they had to deal with um, things like smallpox and uh, measles and the flu for the first time. Um, and they seen all this death around them and they weren't sure what was happening. Um, of course, now we kind of have, you know, we have technology and we can share information. with each other and have a better idea of what's causing this. Still, there's a lot of um, different issues that are affecting uh, our communities as Native people, um, mainly because the, the health issues were ever since colonization and Native people were forced into reservations. Um, we've always been reliant on the government and outside resources for help bees and things like that they they come up short or they don't provide enough resources for these things so this so this issue of our communities having to deal with covid-19 and even other illnesses just all goes back to colonization and how Oh, we've been, um, you know, subjugated and, and lacking the uh, resources to um, improve mm -hmm. our communities. Um, that's not to say that there aren't resources there. Like, typically, the resources are provided through the IHS, which which is the Indian Health Services. Mm -hmm. right. um, they do provide, you know, minimal care and things that are needed. But for things like uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, a lot of the places didn't have um, uh, protective equipment or protective. Um, you know, uh, face masks and things like that. Different. So this all these issues combined are causing Native communities to suffer and. Um, even back home, my, my grandma was talking about the, in the, um, cause I'm also part Seminole and Creek and back home in Oklahoma, um, there's been a, a, a surge of, uh, coronavirus, um, hitting the communities and my grandma, she's not really going out anywhere, but.
but some people have been going out and uh, um, kind of ironically too, there's been funerals for people and then other people will get sick by attending these funerals and um, bringing it back to their family. <laughs> and I think it's just, it's just a combination of things, of pre-existing health conditions, people not taking precautions, and then also the, um, the lack of resources to address this issue. And um, so, and I think it's the thing is like already reservation communities are dealing with a lot of uh, poverty and um, lack those resources anyways. <clears throat> and there was also an issue where the government through the CARES Act wasn't providing uh, the money to tribes so they could get what they needed to deal with COVID-19. And I think it was like two months. Like, and, and the tribal tribal nations had to act. Um, so it's just all these different things of government uh, not being accountable to uh, what they stated within their own treaties to the na to native people, and um, and that's kind of what we're having to do with now. So, but I also wanted to mention too, yeah, like bring up the the traditional aspects of our communities, how they, those have had to change with our um, uh, the way we practice our beliefs, and you know that was kind of my question to to people here who maybe um, have a, a who go to ceremony or have a spiritual teachings and how that has impacted um, your communities in terms of, you know, maybe social distancing or not having uh, places to go to for that. So I think that's the thing is that we just have to be more aware of what we're doing and, um, you know, learn to make adjustments because I think that the important thing is that we're still doing our spiritual ceremony and we realize that the intent is always there, but how do we adjust to ensure that we're also kind of keeping each other safe? And so that's the question now is like, where do we go from here to uh, make sure that we're, you know, able to practice our um, traditions, but also keeping in mind that we need to use our common sense and <laughs> make sure we're not, you know, spreading it to everyone. Um, so essentially that's kind of what I have in terms of presenting some information. Um, and if, the, if anybody has any questions about yeah. uh, questions for me, if you want to go ahead and ask them. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Professor Beeson, uh, what we are going to do, uh, we'll have a quick comment from our discussion, Dr. Hari Priya. Uh, but at the end, like uh, once all the presentations are done, then we will take all the questions together. And even uh, there will be a cross panel discussion. So all the panelists will also uh, like uh, once uh, now you have presented, you can have a view of other panelists as well. So you can even question them. So you will have a better idea, uh, like you will have more questions and more points of discussion by the end of all the presentations. So thank you, uh, Professor Beeson. It was a really nice, concise uh, uh, idea about what the trauma and what are the uh, different uh, problems which are there suffered by the indigenous communities in uh, America, the United States of America and uh, how they are uh, undergoing different kinds of changes, not only in terms of the uh, healthcare system, but also because of this whole COVID, uh, they are reliving the experiences of the past which happened because of the uh, the so uh, the one of the most uh, grievous uh, genocide which ever happened in among the indigenous societies. So I quickly request now um, Dr. Hari Priya to give her quick comments, and then we will proceed for the second presentation. Um, thank you, Veena. Uh, thank yeah. you. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. you can. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you uh, for that presentation. That was uh, it's a first-hand account of what's going on there. That is very rich, um, and I particularly find it ethnographically very um, interesting. Two thoughts, questions, comments that popped up in my head was one about meaning of rituals um, in these kind of circumstances. Um, what kind of meanings do they take when you can't do what you're supposed to do, which is a quintessential part of the ritual? For instance, if, um, if passing the pipe is a very essential part of the ritual, what does it mean to now have a ritual where you don't pass the pipe around? You know, or you don't share that water. What does, how does one reconcile with the kinds of meanings rituals will take uh, because of these uh, precautions about safety um, and health and other issues? And I think that is probably um, a more um, abstract kind of question, but I think it's very important for us to think about uh, the meanings that rituals have. Um, and as uh, the second point, which you have rightly pointed out in your presentation, is about the long history that indigenous communities in the United States have with um, disease and illness that come from elsewhere. You know, that these things which are from the outside and which then come to the community and it has, it takes on, uh, you know, so many uh, forms uh, which have had very um, devastating consequences for the indigenous communities. So one story from that is that of this kind of fear and caution and worry uh, that everyone has. Um, and uh, we also know, as you pointed out, that the indigenous communities in America are one of the most vulnerable already to diabetes. So they have higher comorbidities than the other populations. But is there also, um, is there some continuity um, with uh, history that the communities and the elders can uh, provide to us? Uh, because uh, the story of the indigenous communities in America is also, in whatever way it is, about resilience. And, um, you know, the fact that they have managed for so long to preserve their traditions, preserve their indigenous ways of doing things, including food and other things. Um, so is there something that one can learn from this and uh, share more widely? Is there that part of the story as well is what I'm uh, thinking about. And perhaps, uh, as Bina is saying, in the interest of time, we could uh, think about this and come later when we have a larger discussion. Is that correct, Bina? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Is that okay? Or I don't yeah. know. Bina is yeah. the chair. I'm, no, the no, I'm not the so chair. Bina... <laughs> no, I'm just coordinating. That's why I have deliberately out, uh, you know, yeah. kept that word out. Yeah, I would like um, to hear from you um, yeah. at, about this at the end of the past. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah, these are really interesting questions because what uh, Dr. Haripriya has raised, you know, the uh, the essential meaning of rituals because, you know, we had so many rituals in these past few months, even in Indian traditions. For example, we recently had the Janmashtami and nobody could go to temple. Yeah. And there was no function in any of the... Um, uh, what you call Vaishnav Sampradaya in the major temples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even Tirupati could not hold any of these events. Yeah. So mm, it really has a great, uh, it has a significant impact on the way we visualize the concept of rituals and the sanctity of spiritualism associated to it. So mm -hmm. how do we understand it? Or even, of course, uh, spiritual itself is a very contested term. Uh, so we will definitely, I think, uh, I would really give some time, I suppose, uh, at the end of the discussion, uh, uh, at the end of all the presentation, uh, we would definitely like to have response from uh, Dr. Beeson on this behalf. Uh, so I now request Dr. Roche, uh, Mr. Roche Maiba, who is from Stellenbosch University, South Africa, and presently teaching in an uh, international school of um, in Turkey. So he has like, you know, different experiences of pandemic. Uh, on his uh, presentation, uh, his short bio, I'll be reading. Um, 
uh, 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 Roshi Mayberg holds a bachelor's in the humanities, majoring in the history of the ancient Near East and MPhil in social sciences, specializing in non-linear system theory, systems theories. After spending 12 years in private sector in South Africa and UK as a learning and development consultant and director, he has come back to um, academics. So it's, it's really a pleasure turn for us as well because he's a really good scholar and a wonderful orator. So I now uh, request uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Myberg to present his um, presentation. His title of his presentation is Saving the Trees for the Forest, uh, with, uh, which is actually about associating the indigenous value systems to the idea of uh, environmentalism. So please go ahead, Dr. Myberg. Uh, well, Bina, thank you very much and thank you for the honorary degree. Um, I'll be sure to tell the people at my school about that. Uh, hopefully there will be some benefits to that. Um, yes, well, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share a little with you uh, about the history of South Africa's experience of dealing with pandemics. Um, and I want to really contrast two different um, experiences that South Africa had. Um, I want to talk a little bit about perhaps one of the darkest experiences in South Africa's history uh, regarding uh, the uh, HIV AIDS pandemic towards the end of the 20th century uh, and how that was handled. And then to contrast that a little bit with the early actions taken by the South African government when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. Um, and then to see where that actually leads us in terms of understanding the impacts of of pandemics and whether we are actually addressing the correct causes. Um, so there seems to be no crisis which cannot be made worse by polit political bickering. And to understand how political decision making can make a pandemic worse, uh, we need to look no further than South Africa. We will look at an example of where decisions made seemingly for the benefit of vulnerable people ended up inflicting a terrible toll on the very same people. Now, how does this link to, uh, to the topic? Well, when one thinks about the history of South Africa uh, in terms of apartheid, it is impossible for us not to, uh, not, not to appreciate the extent to which the European influence in South Africa after colonization has obliterated the lifestyle, the traditional lifestyles of black South Africans. We must keep in the back of our minds the fact that over hundreds of years, black people suffered disproportionately under the effects of uh, colonization and South Africa was no different. So we need to talk about the origins of the failure of the HIV policy under President Thabo Mbeki. Now, despite the fact that South Africa has considerable experience dealing with infectious disease and has achieved substantial success, notwithstanding limited government resources, the record of its dealings, uh, its combating the HIV AIDS outbreak is catastrophic. Thabo Mbeki's handling of the HIV AIDS pandemic has been universally and rightly so criticized as an abysmal failure. But we need to appreciate that Mbeki's approach to the pandemic was shaped before he became president. It was shaped during his time as a member of the resistance against the South African apartheid regime. Mbeki harbored deep suspicion towards adopting a Western style approach to combating the HIV AIDS pandemic because of what he knew about the history of colonization in Africa. It would be easy and convenient for us to dismiss Mbeki's adoption of dissident views as simple ignorance. And ignorance certainly abounds uh, around the world when it comes to uh, pandemics. But if we adopt that approach, it would be a most useless explanation, as it neither furthers our understanding of his embrace of dissident views, nor helps us to place his approach into a broader historical narrative. To be clear, Mbeki was not the first person to view uh, 
to advance views at odds with scientific research. And he most certainly will not be the last. One need only refer to the recent destruction of 5G mobile technology towers in Britain to appreciate that pandemics cause people to adopt odd explanations. But we should also be aware that such odd explanations are not without context. Fear surrounding the involvement of Huawei, a Chinese mobile uh, telecoms company, as a provider of 5G mobile technology in Britain, played a part in this. The context for the belief that the COVID-19 virus is spread through high frequency emissions from Huawei mobile technology towers is a fear of a resurgent China. Thus the belief that the virus, which was as the theory goes, man-made in a laboratory in Wuhan, China, for the purposes of reducing the population of the West and undermine their economies. This of course is a belief that is immunized against scientific knowledge. <clears throat> the anti-vaccine movement is even more widespread and expanding, and despite living through the COVID-19 pandemic, barely 53% of respondents to a King's College Ipsos Mori poll published this week indicated that they would definitely accept a vaccination against COVID-19. The disappearance of smallpox remains a mystery. So how did we get here? Rejection of science in favor of a conspiratorial worldview coupled with a refusal to consider contradictory evidence. We can safely say that this is a, a global phenomenon shifted into overdrive by the enabling technologies of social media. And we should therefore dispense with the notion that mere ignorance was to blame for Humbeke's adoption of unorthodox views. And we should try to understand what the context was that made him susceptible to dissident views. Whereas today, Bill Gates is the convenient scapegoat who threatens to, vac to use vaccines to turn young people infertile, Tabu Mbeki saw himself engaged in a battle against a much less far-fetched adversary. After the demise of apartheid, it was uncovered that the apartheid government had experimented with creating biological weapons to use on the black population among others for the purpose of causing infertility among the black majority population. The project failed, but rumors abound that the apartheid government had tried to infect minors with HIV by placing HIV positive sex workers around mines. It was hardly surprising as openly racist interpretations of HIV AIDS were common during the apartheid era. Not least of all, the hope expressed in some parts of white South Africa that AIDS would decimate the numbers of the black majority. This particular rumor merits closer examination because it is revealing about how past colonial practices affects the spread of disease. <clears throat> the apartheid government in South Africa forcibly moved the black population to rural parts of the country and to the four nominally independent homelands created by the government. Their traditional lifestyles decimated by Western industrialization, African laborers migrated from their rural villages to work on the mines in the industrial centers of South Africa, thus far removed from their families and their friends. The migrant laborers were housed in communal accommodation where commercial sex and excessive alcohol consumption were the norm. With men far outnumbering women, the conditions seemed to have been perfect for the spread of HIV. And so men who were infected with HIV on the mines would then return to their rural homes where they spread the disease to their partners. Whether placing HIV positive workers at, at sex workers at the mine was government policy or not, the outcome seems much the same. The virus spread rapidly in industrial centers before being spread across the country by seasonal laborers returning home. This example lends itself to being interpreted, uh, interpreted in a conspiratorial manner. But beyond the conspiracy, the shadow of colonialism hangs over the spread of HIV in South Africa. Mbeki had seen how neoliberal economic policies enrich the West at the expense of developing uh, countries. 
a process which enhances inequality, and no less so in South Africa, where the apartheid government had used medical science to entrench segregation. In fact, the apartheid government did not pioneer this practice in South Africa. In 1900, the colonial government in Cape Town used an outbreak of bubonic plague as a justification for the forcible removal of black Africans to what was called native locations, areas designed for black people to live segregated from the white population. And so when the African National Congress came to power in 1994, they inherited a racially divided and deeply unequal health sector. Those who had access to private health care benefited from high-tech facilities. They were the recipients of 49% of total health care spending and 80% of spending on national medicine. This was a benefit restricted to about 20% of the South African were, by political design, almost exclusively white. The remaining 80% were almost exclusively black had to make do with 51% of healthcare spending and 20% of national spending on medicine. To put that into perspective, 49% of the country's healthcare budget was spent on roughly 6.1 million people. 51% of the healthcare budget was spent on 34.3 million people. That is a staggering ratio. And in a country that already struggled with deep inequality, the administration of new liberal policies could only aggravate the problem. And so Mbeki's suspicion towards a Western economic model was not aided by the fact that following the demise of apartheid, the new ANC government was, to some extent, pushed into accepting neoliberal policies as a condition for foreign aid and investment. Instead of spending, uh, instead of the social spending which the ANC government had envisioned as a means of lifting millions of black people out of poverty, the economic policies with the, which they were pressured to enact further served to entrench economic racial inequality. The historical economic cost of Western aid to Africa is well documented, and Mbeki was not unaware of the cost. At the turn of the 21st century, African countries were spending four times as much on servicing debt as they were on health and education combined. What made the case in South Africa even more unjust was that the ANC government was repaying debt that had been accumulated by the apartheid government to fund its racist policies. Also of special interest here was the role of pharmaceutical companies. The apartheid South African government afforded a high level of protection to patent holders. This meant that key antiretroviral drugs which were produced shortly after the ANC government came to power were protected under patent laws and consequently priced at between four and 12 times the price of the cheapest generic equivalents. The ANC government was obliged to honor the patents of pharmaceutical companies, but with a twist. At the same time, the South African government also introduced the Medicines and Related Substances Control Act number no. 90, which was to be the foundation of a legal framework for national drugs policy. The act was controversial in that it enabled the government to override the patent rights of pharmaceutical companies for reasons of public health. Basically, in an emergency, the government could issue a fast track license to manufacture a drug without obtaining authorization from the patent holder. But the global response to this act was swift. The Clinton administration placed South Africa on its special 301 trade watch list and threatened sanctions. In 1998, the Vice President of the European Commission wrote to then Vice President Thabo Mbeki to complain that the South African law would damage the interests of pharmaceutical companies. However, following an international outcry over the US reaction, President Clinton relented and removed South Africa from the special 301 watch list in 1999. 
In fact, in May 2000, Clinton signed an executive order in which he committed the USA no longer to threaten trade sanctions against sub-Saharan countries, sub-Saharan African countries, which try to improve access to HIV steps, provided that these steps were compliant with the WTO trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement. Belatedly, the European Trade Commissioner noted in 2000 that the WTO trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement did, in fact, allow for the actions taken by the South African government. The willingness of the Clinton administration and the EU to threaten action against the South African government only to then relent on those threats would have looked suspicious to Mbeki as it seemed to fit neatly into a historic pattern of Western states pursuing their economic interests at the expense of the health and lives of impoverished Africans. And yet, pharmaceutical companies did not let the matter go. A court case would be brought by 39 pharmaceutical companies against the South African government, claiming that the law violated the Constitution though not before Mbeki, who was now one year into his presidency, launched South Africa onto a trajectory to infamy. But the distrust of Western intentions and actions then briefly sets the background for Mbeki's response to the HIV AIDS pandemic. <clears throat> By April 2000, Mbeki had made clear to leaders of the world in a letter on the subject of AIDS, but he believed Africa faced challenges that were unique. And so that meant that Africa could not adopt a Western style approach to combating HIV AIDS. Although the letter indicated a practical approach, which included cooperation with numerous segments of South African societies, including youth, women, business leaders, and faith communities, Mbeki also indicated that the fight against HIV AIDS must be part of the fight against poverty. But Mbeki proposed that Africa should not follow a Western approach to combat the virus, coupled with a reaction to the South African government's attempt to obtain cheaper generic drugs, suggests that Mbeki was concerned that the West and Western pharmaceutical companies would exploit the pandemic to the disadvantage of Africans. For Mbeki, the fight against the pandemic was a political battle against Western economic exploitation of Africa. It was a fight for African freedom and dignity. By the time Mbeki wrote this letter, he had already entertained the position of denialist scientists, a minority and marginal group of scientists who disputed the claim that HIV, AIDS, uh, HIV causes AIDS, proposing instead that AIDS is caused by malnutrition or narcotics. Some even maintains that AIDS is caused by the very antiretroviral drugs that were meant to treat the disease. If it was not a cause of the disease, then it was maintained antiretroviral drugs were in fact toxic. HIV itself was relegated to a benign passenger virus. The claims of these denialists were incorporated into government policy. And so having come to the conclusion that HIV AIDS was a disease caused by lifestyle, not by the transmission of the HIV virus. The South African government's approach to antiretroviral drugs appear also to have suffered as a result of its early endorsement of viridine as an effective treatment of HIV in 1997. Virodine, as it turned out later, <clears throat> was nothing more than an industrial solvent, not unlike bleach. And the Medical Control Council determined that virodine was more likely to kill the patient suffering from AIDS than the virus itself. Such opportunism reinforced the idea that while suffering from significantly lower levels of infections, the West, true to historic habit, saw the HIV AIDS explosion in Africa as an economic opportunity. And in the face of this belief, the South African government dug in their heels, much to the horror of the scientific community. 
There appeared to be some return to a more scientific approach when Mbeki convened the International AIDS Conference in Durban for July 2000. But Mbeki's ongoing support for dissident views led to 5,000 scientists to express their support for the scientific view in the Durban Declaration. Despite the opposition of civil groups and scientists, it still required intense national and international media coverage before the South African government finally agreed to start providing nevirapine, an antiretrovirus drug that prevents mother-to-child transmission, and then only to a selected few pilot sites, reaching no more than about 10% of pregnant women. <clears throat> Additionally, in 2001, in April, the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Aid Association dropped the lawsuit that brought against the South African government three years earlier. Between February and May 2001, the price of medication also started to decrease. However, these positive signs masked the prevailing doubts that Mbeki and the South African government harbored about HIV AIDS. And these issues were again laid bare when Mbeki wrote to the Minister of Health, questioning the mortality data surrounding HIV AIDS. And in March 2002, ANC leaders again asserted that the hypothesis that HIV causes AIDS is an assumption, not a fact. <clears throat> and even as Mbeki formally distanced himself from the dissident AIDS movement, in April 2002, matters were complicated when an anonymous document entitled Castro Longuane began circulating in the South African parliament. This document asserted that a global north stood to make large financial gains in the event of an AIDS crisis in South Africa. In 2016, Mbeki finally acknowledged that he was the author. The document confirmed that from Mbeki's perspective, Africa was being exploited by an entire cooperative of Western pharmaceutical companies governments and even health organizations and NGOs, and so were entirely unreliable. For Mbeki, the racism of the past uh, colonial exploitation of Africa was at the heart of the HIV AIDS pandemic. That the pandemic emerged at the end of the apartheid era and inflicted on millions of Africans yet more misery was, in Mbeki's view, surely a denial of justice to those who had suffered so much. It is a tragedy that the policies which Mbeki implemented under the guise of fighting against one denial of justice resulted in millions of others being denied the justice of life-saving medication. It required an intervention by the Constitutional Court of South Africa in July 2002 before the government made nevirapine universally available to all pregnant women. It would be easy for us to conclude that Mbeki and his government were plain incompetent or ignorant, beguiled by pseudoscience and quackery. There can be no denying the fact that Mbeki's approach cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of people with millions more infected. A 2008 study published in the Journal of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome estimated that between 2000 and 2005, there were 330,000 premature AIDS-related deaths, and some 35,000 babies were born with HIV infections, which could have been prevented through the use of antiretroviral treatment. We can point to Mbeki and Health Minister Mantu Shabalala Nzimang's promotion of herbal remedies such as beetroot, garlic and lemon as examples of scientific illiteracy run rampant. But that would be misplaced. Mbeki was a thoughtful, intelligent and a hard-working person. He was a skilled diplomat and by no means unqualified for the job of president. Allowing ourselves to ridicule such absurdities, which mean that we miss an opportunity to examine other factors that played a part in the AIDS tragedy in South Africa. Ignorance certainly is a real danger in the time of pandemic, 
but so too is a refusal to listen to contradictory evidence and the crushing of opposition. The former was not a feature of Mbeki, but both of the latter certainly were. Mbeki was aware of the consensus view among the experts, but he thought he knew better and he would not entertain criticism. In Mbeki's ANC, one towed the party line. The figures for infection and premature death stand as testimony of the dangers posed by leaders who marginalize and intimidate those who differ from them. Maybe the most important lesson that should be learned from South Africa's history of battling HIV AIDS is that the introduction of appropriate strategies and treatments will improve the situation. Once the South African government started rolling out prevention strategies and antiretroviral treatment, South Africa saw a 30% decline in new infections after 2004. But there are still some 7.7 .7 million people living with HIV in South Africa. That number could have been considerably higher had the South African government not implemented an aggressive find, treat and prevent strategy. South Africa also adopted the UN AIDS 1990-90 by 2020 goal, which is 90% of infected people know about their status, 90% of all people diagnosed with HIV AIDS infection will receive sustained treatment, and 90% of all people receiving treatment will have their viral load suppressed. By 2018, the South African government had attained the first of these with 90% of people living with HIV aware of their status. 68% of all HIV diagnosed people were receiving sustained treatment and 88% of people receiving treatment have viral load suppression. Much work still needs to be done. But we are seeing the results of a properly coordinated and implemented strategy to fight HIV. The country has the world's largest antiretroviral treatment program, and this has been further expanded with the implementation of test and treat guidelines. South Africa was the first sub-Saharan country to approve pre-exposure prophylactics for people who are not HIV positive, but are in the high risk category. And as a result of South Africa's approach to combating HIV AIDS, AIDS related deaths were halved between 2010 and 2018. South Africa is still seeing an annual new infection rate of around 240,000, which is only a 40% reduction from 2010. And this brings us to this, a second important lesson. There should be no let up in combating a pandemic. Given the current COVID-19 pandemic, New Zealand near enough eradicated the virus from its shores, only for the country only for Auckland to have to go back into lockdown this past week. There can be no room for complacency during pandemics. Infection rates, no matter how low, can bounce back. By 2014, only some 50% of HIV positive South Africans were aware of their status. And had this level of awareness remained, the number of people being treated would be significantly lower and so the number of deaths would also have increased. People who are not aware of their HIV status cannot take precautions to prevent them from spreading the disease, and the fight against HIV AIDS would have been even harder. <clears throat> As it is, South Africa has increased the percentage of people getting tested for HIV from 30% in 2005 to 75% today. We are seeing an increase in people testing for HIV across all socio-demographic characteristics. However, the traditionally higher risk groups comprising young people, men, never married people, and people with lower education levels, unemployed people, and people living in rural areas are less likely to test for HIV AIDS than others. This clearly represents a risk and a high number of infections South Africa still faces demonstrates this. Reassuringly, the number of black South Africans who are getting tested has also increased substantially since 2015, 2017. Life expectancy has also increased from 56 in 2010 to 63 by 2018. And this is testimony 
of the success of South Africa's antiretroviral treatment campaign. So what can we learn? What can we take from our HIV AIDS strategy and use in the, to combat COVID-19? South Africa has learned an important lesson when it comes to combating pandemics. Soon after cases of COVID-19 appeared on South African soil, the government applied its find, treat, prevent strategy to combating COVID-19 by sending mobile clinics into densely populated areas to identify cases and trace contacts. In Johannesburg, the Orem Institute, a research health and healthcare nonprofit organization, redeployed its 3,000 employees to assist the government's test and trace efforts. In Durban, the Africa Health Institute, which is usually focused on HIV and TB, has mobilized its entire staff and infrastructure to fighting COVID-19. As part of the eff this effort, it is deploying mobile clinics, community workers, and laboratories for testing. All the while, scientists in South Africa are studying patterns of transmission and developing methods to limit infections. These meticulous efforts now will bring benefits for future pandemics. It is worth bearing in mind that Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa, have played a crucial role in the development of medication. Many of the antiretrovirals which are used worldwide were tested in Africa and found to be effective in treating HIV AIDS. New preventative measures were developed as a result of the extensive involvement of women in clinical HIV research. And one of the standout achievements of the contribution of science in Africa was the development of guidelines for treating AIDS and TB co-infections, as well as the timing of pediatric antiretroviral therapy initiation, to mention but two. If the COVID-19 has pushed the healthcare systems of many advanced countries into dire territory, and many in South Africa do not have access to such advanced healthcare, and this presents a worry for how the virus will affect South Africa. In recognition of this, South Africa established a Solidarity Response Fund. This is a public-private partnership and is tasked with allocating resources towards preventing transmission of the virus understanding the magnitude of the pandemic and caring for patients in vulnerable communities. By April, it had raised more than $50 million through voluntary contributions. And as a part of the effort to combat the spread of fake news, such as the rumor that Africans are somehow immune from the virus, a private firm in South Africa Prekelt.org created a WhatsApp-based helpline for the purposes of providing real-time data and automated responses in numerous languages to educate and sensitize awareness. Within 10 days of launching, over 10.5 million people subscribed, and the effectiveness of this enterprise has seen Prekelt enter into partnership with the World Health Organization to provide a similar service worldwide. For South Africans, there is a stark contrast between the manner in which President Cyril Ramaphosa is handling COVID-19 and Thabo Hanbeki's handling of HIV AIDS. A week after the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, President Ramaphosa met with, with the 14 political parties represented in the South African Parliament and built cross-party consensus on how to fight and contain the spread of COVID-19. South Africa introduced one of the harshest lockdowns worldwide with early prohibitions on outdoor exercises and the sale of alcohol and cigarettes. Ramaphosa declared a state of emergency and he established a national command council for the purpose of coordinating all aspects of the COVID-19 emergency response. Ramaphosa, unlike Mbeki, has followed an inclusive and collaborative approach centered on the clear communication of advice informed by science. This decisive display of leadership won Ramaphosa praise from UNAIDS and the World Health Organization. However, Ramaphosa was also criticized for being too heavy handed, especially after a number of civilians were killed by the armed forces for breaking lockdown rules. And as elsewhere, Economic costs of the lockdown means that it cannot be sustained for a protracted period of time. 
Many black South Africans have no savings, which means that if businesses are not operating, they have no income and starvation becomes a real prospect for many. As with previous pandemics, COVID-19 is further entrenching inequality in an already very unequal society, with black South Africans suffering disproportionately from the economic fallout. Given the enormous costs of the lockdown, coupled with South Africans' existing moribund economy, currency problems, and inflation, the long-term impact of the lockdown has seen ruptures emerge in the initial consensus following the declaration of a national emergency. The lockdown is costing South Africa around $1 billion a day, and this plainly is not sustainable. But the solution can also not be a premature return to normal, as we can see the consequences of such decisions playing out daily in the rising number of infections around the world. It is time for us to recognize that we are pursuing an unsustainable solution. <clears throat> we are left to ponder what our approach should be to fighting pandemics. And South Africa has first-hand experience of the devastation caused by a leader who refused to follow scientific advice. But now we are also witnessing the limitations even of decisive leadership guided by scientific advice. We seem to find ourselves facing a choice between staying at home to be safe and going to work at great personal risk. And we can hardly blame people for wanting the lockdown lifted in order to afford food or to keep a roof over their head. But we should not be mesmerized by economic arguments. That is not to say that we should ignore the economic costs. Rather, if we are concerned about the economic cost of dealing with pandemics, as indeed we ought to be, we need to consider the origins of the viruses that cause pandemics. Prior to COVID-19, around 2 million people die and died annually from zoonotic diseases. At the heart of the transmission of viruses from animal to human lies the destruction of nature. As much as certain world leaders would have us believe that no one could have predicted COVID-19, the reality is that this pandemic was all too predictable. We may not at any given moment know which virus will cause a pandemic, but we know for certain that at some point a virus will come along which will, have, which will cause a pandemic. For as much as we can look to past pandemics to learn about mitigating the impacts based on medical science or economic cost analysis, until such a time as we recognize that the origin of pandemics lie in the, in the environment, we will continue to leave ourselves vulnerable to the next pandemic. For all of South Africa's advances in the area of combating HIV AIDS, for all the preparations and decisive action taken by the government, the country was still brought to its knees by COVID-19. There are limits to the application of scientific expertise to symptoms if we do not also address the causes. And it should by now be abundantly clear that there are a number of zoonotic diseases with pandemic potential. From a historical point of view, the claim that no one saw this coming is non-tolerable. Europeans have been holding conferences on managing pandemics since the 19th century. Social distancing was practiced as far back as the 14th century. But it was really the European colonial enterprise which brought the risk of pandemics to bear for Europeans. Having exported diseases like smallpox to the Americas and Africa, Europeans also found that they were importing diseases from the tropics, which showed Europe to be vulnerable to diseases emerging from their colonies. Towards the end of the 18th century, the limitations of case-by-case -case and uncoordinated quarantines in European harbors became a real concern. Europeans discovered they needed a new system for managing infectious diseases. And so from 1851 to 1931, uh, 1938, no fewer than 14 conferences were held with the aim of developing a set of regulations that were to be standardized internationally and which would govern quarantine procedures and sanitary uh, procedures. For us, 
when we look at the consequences of the mismanagement of the HIV AIDS pandemic, and if we look at the consequences of even decisive leadership and following advice by science, we cannot deny the fact that we need a different approach. And this approach has to include the preservation of nature. For those who say that it is too costly to preserve nature, it would cost between 22.7 and $30 billion annually to preserve our forests. Whereas the fallout from dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic is around $15 trillion. It would seem that perhaps the best cure, the best treatment for the preservation of our civilization would be in fact to save the tree for the forest. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Roche. I'm really sorry for, for uh, at the end, I have to tell you that we summarize. So it was like an abrupt closure. You, we really want to know what actually how you build that up particular argument. So I request now Haripriya to give her comments and then we will proceed to the presentation of the rose. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Roche. That, uh, Ms. Roche, that was very detailed, very well articulated. Um, and you walked us through the history of how things were in South Africa during Tarabo Mbeki's period and how things are now. But obviously the major uh, point that you're trying to make is about how um, this pandemic is as much a political crisis as it is a health crisis. So if it is going to be resolved, it will be resolved only when politically everybody is on the same page. Um, otherwise, this blame game is always going to go on about how it came from somewhere else. It never originated where people are. It's always some outsider, whether it's an animal or a whatever insect. Um, it's never us which ca caused the problem. Um, it's always somebody, and we need to do something about it. The second point I think that also emerges from your presentation is about how science is also equally political. Um, that to assume that science is some kind of uh, discipline or which takes place in a vacuum with no ulterior motives and whatever science finds um, is, um, you know, altruistic and will be um, equitably distributed to all parts of the world is just not true. And South Africa's experience with AIDS tells us that. Um, uh, the question that emerges in my, and, and, and the last point, sorry, is the crucial role that pharma industry um, is going to play. Um, you know, there is a reason to believe that perhaps this pandemic will uh, bring governments to concentrate more on providing good public affordable health infrastructure. But um, I'm afraid uh, what um, we also have to be prepared for is that the pharma industry is, go is not going to let its control go so easily. And I think these are, for me personally, these are the big three takeaways from your presentation. Um, one question that I have for you, which uh, if you would like to address to the end, uh, I'll be grateful, is um, uh, this uh, new word that is being pandered about called vaccine nationalism. Um, you know, these sort of countries, um, governments, actually, um, taking control of producing this vaccine and then going to sit on it, like they did with drugs, antiretroviral drugs for years, um, you know, bringing in all this patenting and all kinds of other issues, um, that along with the undermining of the WHO that has happened. Um, how do you see it in... Um, 
from the takeaways that we have with the South African experience, uh, could you hasten a guess about where this will go? This discussion on vaccine nationalism with a very weak, if not completely um, extinguished WHO um, in the meantime, you know, if you could address that, um, that'll be interesting. Okay, Veena? Thanks a lot. Am I doing yeah. okay on time? Oh, you're doing great. You're always great. <laughs> you're always a corrective one. <laughs> so I'm really glad you are. You're bringing some uh, really incisive points, you know, which need to be addressed at the when we will be having a uh, this closed room discussions among the panelists and yourself. Uh, so thank you, and I do hope uh, Roshi will have a wonderful answers to them ready with uh, during the discussion time. Uh, so now I request uh, Feroz uh, Baruteo from Tajikistan Media. So you know, like uh, the first two presenters were more like academicians; they were they are academicians, and Feroz is more a uh, journalist, so who who works with the direct oh, oh, ground reality. So. Uh, I'll, uh, so, uh, Feroz is going to speak on experiences of Tajikistan on pandemic, past mm -hmm. and present. So, he's going to address also the past uh, pandemic. Uh, in between, uh, I'll just read his short bio. Uh, Mr. Feroz Barutev is a journalist and media expert with extensive experience in multimedia journalism, photography, editing, media consulting, social media, media and human rights, training for the journalist and youth in the human rights issues. Firoz lead the regional media project, contributing uh, to stability and peace in Central Asia through media literacy, improved reporting, and regional cooperation. In Tajikistan, funded by European Union and implemented by Internews. In that position, he managed the process of implementing this project in the country and supporting media representatives to develop their professionalism on conflict-sensitive reporting. Firuz Barutev has been working in the media field since 2002 and provides consultancy about media and political situation in Tajikistan to local and international media organization and youth NGO and conducts training on international professional media standards, photojournalism, radio and online journalism. Professional covering specific issue in Tajik media like an election, human rights, gender issues, domestic violence, HIV, AIDS, agriculture, youth radicalization, etc. As a journalist, he has written more than 1,500 reports for the Tajik Service Radio Liberty for 10 years and as a trainer has conducted hundreds of training for youth and journalists. During last seven years, under his coordination and management, Tajik Media Outlets and Media and NGO implemented 20 media projects in Tajikistan, which were focused on media development, new media, for youth journalism, citizen journalism, environment, legal, and digital security. Feroz, in his project and training, gives special attention to media, law, and teach, uh, teaches colleagues to avoid media lawsuits. From January to October 2017, NAN Summit implemented the project Legal Support for Tajik Journalists. And Feroz, as a media law consultant, administrates the Facebook page, Digital Serve, a Facebook page called Digital Self-Protection Journalism Group and provide a journalist, uh, journalist with recommendation on cybersecurity and law. Firoz investigated 42 cases of journalists in conflict with the law and prepared legal consultation according to every single case as well. Along with this such a prolific CV, Firoz is also a Fulbright scholar who worked with the Boston Law College and during his Fulbright tenure, he was with Fulbright, uh, sorry, New York, uh, Boston Law College and uh, Brooklyn Law School. Oh, sorry, Brooklyn Law College. And there we happened to meet and we became, uh, we became friends. And he's such a great friend in terms of enlightening about the whole Central Asian politics. So without taking too much of your time while reading his such a huge profile, I'll uh, invite Feroz now to give his presentation. Hello, dear colleagues. Hello, dear friends. Uh, thank you for uh, providing such an opportunity to me uh, with um, like talking about the uh, situation in Tajikistan. Um, I would like to uh, tell you that the situation in uh, all countries, Central Asia, it's uh, similar. But uh, let's uh, look closer to the situation through uh, Tajikistan. Uh, 
So yeah. uh, now, yeah, you have to go to the present now. Presentation. Yeah, go ahead. So, is it good? Yes, it's Please perfect. Yes, Great. we can. So, um, in the beginning, I would like to. Uh, oh my God. Uh huh. Yeah. Today we will talk about the reaction of the government to acknowledge the existence of the virus, uh, the pressure of civil society and independent media to government and WHO to admit to existence of COVID-19 in Tajikistan. Also, we will talk the, about the situation in the country and the process of treatment and preventing spread of the virus in country. Uh, new distillations, the limit of travels, weddings, uh, holidays, and funeral ceremonies, economic situation, and the impact of COVID-19 on human life, uh, COVID-19 and the presidential election in Tajikistan, uh, pandemic during the civil war, and uh, TB and value of deaths. So uh, in the beginning, I would like to provide a short information uh, about uh, the country. Uh, Tajikistan is the smallest country in Central Asia with uh, uh, 143,000 uh, km2. 93% uh, of uh, the territory is uh, mountains and uh, seven, only 70% valley and plain territory. Uh, Tajikistan has a more uh, 9 million population. So uh, Tajikistan has a border with Afghanistan, China, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. And uh, unfortunately, the country is under the influence of Russia and China. So, oh, sorry, not yet. <laughs> the symbol of the country you see here, and uh, our currency, uh, Somoni. And our uh, like in the in Somoni, you see the uh, picture of the king uh, Ismaili Somoni, king of uh, uh, Somoni Empire. Uh, and well, let's uh, hear the so national song, and uh, later I will explain why I decide to use our national song to this presentation. Uh, Dhanraj, can you help uh, Feroz in playing this song? Playing the national anthem, if it is possible. Yeah, uh, hearing our song? No, we can't hear it. Okay. So let's uh, save the time. Uh, I can uh, share the link or on YouTube it's possible to hear a uh, nation, Tajik national song. Uh, but uh, why I decided to use a uh, Tajik national song because uh, like on certain August, just two days before, um, the author of national song of Tajikistan died and uh, he had hospitalized with the symptoms of coronavirus. So, um, unfortunately, 2020 for Tajik society uh, was, uh, we can say that very um, like uh, bad and dark year because we lost uh, all, a lot of our uh, famous people. Uh, COVID-19 killed uh, journalists, professors, actors, uh, and most teachers and doctors. Uh, also, a lot of regular people uh, was a victim of uh, COVID-19. Till August 13, uh, the number of uh, cases in Tajikistan officially is 7,950. From this number, uh, only 63% died. It's according to the of, uh, official statistic. But according to the civil page, uh, kvtj.info, uh, uh, the number of deaths uh, in Tajikistan, uh, it's more high, 446 citizens of Tajikistan died from COVID-19. And uh, this number came only from uh, the, uh, uh, from, uh, the people who uh, gave information to the page. And uh, I uh, guess that the original number is more high because uh, in the rural area of Tajikistan, still not all people have access to internet and uh, to social media. So uh, from these 446 uh, uh, cases, Radio Ozodi could verify 552 cases, uh, which is still uh, three times more than official statistic. Uh, 
So uh, the reaction of the government to acknowledge the existence of the COVID-19 in country, uh, it was, uh, for me, was very um, interesting that it took a long time uh, to um, admit the existence of the virus in country. Till the end of the April, when entire world fought with the COVID-19, the Tajik government tried not to admit the existence of the virus in the country, even when the hospitals were full of the patients and in social media were published a lot of videos from the suspicious funeral of people, from medicine personals. The Ministry of Health diagnosed all these people pneumonia. WHO also makes a statement that Tajikistan is free of COVID-19. People were in a panic. They didn't know to trust official information or the reality. They left that something bad is, they felt that something bad is happening. But the Tajik government was one of the first countries in Central Asia, which limited on the 10th of March, all international travels with countries where the risk of COVID was high. At the end of the month, their border was totally closed. The hospitals were full, the people got sick, but all diagnosis was same, pneumonia. Uh, the pressure of civil society and independent media to government and WHO to admit the existence of COVID-19 in Tajikistan was high. When the Tajik government tried to ignore the existence of the COVID-19, but uh, the entire world fought with the virus and reported about the huge number of infected and deaths, Tajikistan continued to conduct public mass events like the Navruz celebration and the visit of the president into Hujan. State uh, TV continued broadcasting concerts and positive news, but social media and independent media were full of reports about the possibility of existing COVID-19. The suspicious symptoms of pneumonia look like COVID-19. The number of uh, negative opinions on social media increased as well. Only after Rustami Emomali, uh, the son of our president, was elected to the position of head of parliament in Tajikistan, which means the second person in country, Tajik government admits the existence of the virus and reported about the first 15 infected. At the same time, the media journalists and doctors were under persecution and pressure for spreading panic in society. The Ozodli page was blocked, the page Akhbor.com was banned, and several journalists get warning from law enforcement departments. So why government tried to hide the COVID-19? Um, experts had several opinions. First, uh, it is uh, poverty uh, and also uh, panic in society because in the beginning of the March, when uh, um, in society was a panic that uh, it will be quarantine and all stores will be closed. The border was, uh, as I mentioned, that the border was closed and uh, Tajikistan uh, mainly uh, imported the, pro uh, the product from uh, neighbor countries. The people were in a panic and they tried to buy uh, a lot of products. And uh, that's just for preventing this uh, panic. Uh, it was one of the reasons that the uh, government um, try to hide uh, existence of COVID-19 uh, in country. And uh, the second version was that uh, the uh, health um, system of Tajikistan was not ready, is not ready to, um, you know, for this pandemic. Uh, the third one is immigration, uh, poverty I mentioned, and the um, other version why the government tried to hide uh, the COVID-19 was uh, like uh, to provide a uh, good opportunity, like a uh, condition uh, for uh, like uh, electing uh, his, uh, like a uh, president's son for the position head of the parliament in Tajikistan. The situation in the country and the process of treatment and preventing spread of the virus in country. Before admitting the virus, government was preparing the hospitals and sports halls shows his readiness to fight with the pandemic. Tajik government says the treatment of the citizens infected with COVID is free, but the people who had the chance to recover it said that only the bed and the medical service were free. They bought the drugs and medicine for around 500 USD because the price of lot antibiotics raised up. Some patients told to media that the treatment was free and they bought only vitamins. Uh, 
Still, the government was not happy to accept the existence of the COVID-19, and most of the reasons for the death were marked as pneumonia. Also, it's uh, interesting that the Minister of the Health uh, to, uh, Tajikistan uh, last month, uh, he made a statement and said that the doctors who died because of the COVID-19, they uh, uh, they uh, didn't get infection uh, during his professional activity. They uh, were infected in a public transport or somewhere else. So uh, with this kind of statements, government try, uh, do not take responsibility for the death of the doctors who uh, like worked very hard in that time. The patients who died from pneumonia, like uh, buried uh, in a plastic bags, disinfected with the participation of the medical personnel. This scared most of the conservative people and they decided to treat themselves at home. People uh, suspected that it was coronavirus, but they get sick with the symptoms mixed like pneumonia and flu, with the loss of the test for the food and high temperature. So this is a, in this photo you can see how uh, like it ha happened. So uh, finally, pneumonia or COVID-19. Tajik government still try to not to attract special attention to coronavirus. The head of the private clinic Ibn Sina Abdul Khalil Holik Zoda said to media that till 2nd of April in Tajikistan was passed only 700 tests and the result of all tests was negative. Some doctors confidentially say to media that the diagnosed dead people pneumonia if they had the symptoms of COVID-19, but because of the lack of the test, they could not diagnose their deaths because of the coronavirus. So new legislation, the limit of the travels, weddings, holidays, and funeral ceremonies. Uh, according to the Committee of the Religion Tajikistan, weddings should be celebrated with the participation of 30 to 40 guests. Before this number was 100 people. According to the law, the number of guests in banquet could be 150 and in Oshinahor, uh, like morning palo ceremony, 200. So I would like to tell you that this, uh, to celebrate weddings uh, with uh, 30 to 40 guests in Tajikistan, it's a real problem. So relating uh, Ramadan and Kurban holidays was limited. And for the first time, Namazi Eid, holiday prayers, were not allowed in the country. The Friday's namaz also not allowed in most. Tajikistan celebrated the day of national unity, unusual without concerts and parades. Also, President of Tajikistan on July 4 signed an amendment for the Code of Administration Violence regarding COVID-19. According to this change, for the spreading disinformation about COVID-19, citizens can get a summons from 580 to 11,600 somoni. It's about 50 to $1,100. The salary of regular workers in country is 400 to 2,000 somoni. International media organizations criti criticized Tajikistan for signing this amendment because it's limiting freedom of speech and increased censorship on media. Punishment for not wearing masks and violence of quarantine disciplines, uh, summons can be 116 to 290 somoni. For um, deliberately infection of people with COVID-19 and other disease, the punishment can be from two to 10 years of prison. So COVID-19 uh, impact the economic of Tajikistan as well. Uh, the number of money transaction of immigration to the country decreased. From Russia, it was 50% or $80 million less than the same period of 2019. Immigration is uh, one of the e um, main income for the majority of families in the country. According to of World Bank, the Tajik economy feels crisis this year, but Tajik authorities are an optimist and they are promising 5% of economic development this year. Export and import of product decreased compared to the same period of the year in the country. In May 2020, Tajikistan import uh, in 195 million dollars and export for 40 million dollars. The export 56, the import 32 percentage decreased. Tajikistan did not announce national quarantine. The experts said that the reason was the poor of economic situation in country. 
According to the experts' opinion, Tajikistan had about $600 million damage from COVID-19. So um, the uh, most, again, interesting uh, fact is that uh, the parliament of Tajikistan offered to change the day of election from November to October because of the COVID-19 and the weather. Presidential election will happen on 11 October 2020, but uh, like um, and political uh, company, uh, political parties, they are just starting uh, introducing their candidacy. Uh, till uh, now, uh, only two political party uh, they present their candidates, but uh, like um, the, the agrarian party, which um, this morning present uh, like presented uh, his candidates. Um, uh, seven years ago, also participated in election, and uh, he uh, gave uh, his vote to our uh, previous president, Emomali Rahman. So, uh, during civil war uh, in Tajikistan, also like uh, was a very strange for country pandemic. It's uh, called heliotropic hepatitis. 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 In 1992, during civil war and after collapsing the USSR in the Khatlon region of Tajikistan, where a pandemic, heliotropic hepatitis, which uh, infected more than 8,000 people and killed 500 people. The pandemic was in the tire of uh, one region and was prevented to spread out in country because of the civil war, people also had limited connection with each other. With, each, uh, with other regions. And they get infection with using poison seeds, which was used in floor. So you can see in the photo uh, that the stomach uh, like, um, of the uh, sick people like, growing and becoming like balloons. Uh, in tub tuberculosis also was one of the main problem of the country, even during USSR. In 2004, were published report about this disease in two villages of the Vose region, Pushyoni Bolo and Pushyoni Poyon. In this region was uh, mentioned that uh, in this report was mentioned that the time uh, that time from 1980 till 2004, every week they have at least one loss. During 20 years in that village, 140 families fully died. Their, their houses were empty without owners. These days, with the uh, support of international donors organizations, the situation with tuberculosis in the country under control. And the treatment of this um, uh, disease in country provided free. So uh, uh, coming back uh, about the situation um, with COVID, uh, in Tajikistan, according to the news reports, um, the, uh, like, the uh, number of uh, the uh, uh, sick people on co with the COVID symptoms is increasing, and as I mentioned, that we uh, lost our the, the the author of our national uh, song, and uh, today also uh, died one of the famous singers in Tajikistan. Um, so uh, the, the doctor said that um, he uh, died because of the uh, diabetic disease. But um, in social media, people uh, guess that uh, the people who have diabetic is very vulnerable um, in front of COVID-19. So, uh, and um, the, uh, on social media also, like uh, it's possible to get uh, to um, get information that the number uh, of um, like the COVID is spreading. Uh, out again, uh, it's developing again, but the, uh, the government says that uh, the situation is under control. Thank you, Bina, and thank you, friends, for uh, being with me during this presentation. Thank you, Feroz, for such a nice presentation because you brought about all the nuisance which is going on right now because of COVID and COVID-induced political decisions. Thank you. I now request uh, Hari Priya to please come and stay. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Feroz. Um, that is very interesting. And I think you have uh, 
uh, continued in the trajectory in which the previous two presenters spoke about, um, talking about the centrality of um, the state, you know, the reaction of the government, the state to the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, to go back to uh, one of the great scholars who talked about, um, you know, McLuhan's, Marshall McLuhan's questions about the media, you know, what does it hide uh, when it tells and what does it tell by hiding? So I think what you have shown is how the media can play a role by saying that, um, you know, 19 people have died when maybe actually 400 have died or something. Um, so the role of the media, and I think that is probably something we are going to see more of in the future, because we are living in a very hyper mediated world, right? Um, so where uh, citizens have, uh, you know, we may not have access to a TV station, but we have access to Twitter and uh, Facebook and everything. And even ordinary citizens can uh, become uh, journalists, right, by pointing out. So then um, I think what your paper talks about is how the role of the media in a pandemic is very central. Um, you know, what has happened. And one of the things I think uh, your paper makes uh, very explicit is we should not assume that just because there is more media, then that naturally means there is more transparency. Though these two need not go together. That, mm -hmm. uh, that media can be, as McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan said so many years ago, media can be used, in fact, to uh, decide what needs to be told, what need not be told. Maybe uh, sometimes the governments are also right to think that they don't want to create panic. Um, but uh, then how do you balance with giving correct data about how many people got infected, how many people died, how many people died of pneumonia, which was not induced due to COVID, and how many people died of pneumonia, which is seen as just a symptom of COVID. So I think that is very important, what you are talking about. And I would like to know maybe how the civil society in Tajikistan uh, is um, dealing with this. Uh, how are uh, ordinary people, uh, the, what tools do they have then uh, to gain and in, get information? What, where do we go to get information in the age of uh, media also playing such a role in this pandemic by uh, telling or by hiding? I mean, it is happening, I guess, everywhere. Um, so that will be uh, something I would really like to know uh, about uh, how ordinary people and civil society, citizens and civil society, you have government and media. You know, we understood that from the paper. But if you could also tell us a little bit more about uh, that, it will be interesting to hear later. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Feroz, you noted down the question of uh, Dr. Hari Priya, because uh, during the discussion time, you have to answer that. So uh, thank you, Feroz. And um, of course, we will resume all these discussions uh, after the presentation of our last presenter, Dr. Omkar Mittal. Uh, Dr. Omkar Mittal is <clears throat> the founder of an organization called Swastha Hind, which is based in Delhi, India. And uh, uh, today he is going to present uh, something about COVID and COVID as a, which we already discussed about how the media and government work in making a certain illness or an epidemic or a pandemic to be a social and societal threat. So uh, uh, he will be presenting something on that in outlines, although he has changed his presentation so that we will get to know during his presentation. Uh, I'll read this short bio. Dr. Umkar Mittal is a social health activist for the past 39 years. He worked at grassroots for raising the voice of the poor and developing an understanding of social practices with, my, uh, with uh, his colleagues and civil society. He also worked with government and donor development agencies like UNICEF, WHO India and DFID India. On a range of sectoral issues in urban basic services, health sector reform, RMNCH uh, uh, that is rural health and uh, 
maternal health, child health, water and sanitation, disaster prevention and relief, to name a few. He worked as a health advisor to DFID India in the years uh, between 1995 to 2003. Uh, in these years, he worked in states of Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh and Kerala in various projects and programs of DFID. He was with DFID UK in London in the year in the year 2001 uh, for the Millennium Development Goals, were, um, when the Millennium Development Goals were being worked out. For the past 16 years, he is working on his own on health policy and governance issues in Delhi, UP, Bihar, and Jharkhand. Uh, his uh, current interest is to focus on defining the framework of accountable governance in India through decentralization of governance and administration and empowerment of communities and at the same time contributing to the uh, uh, SDG, uh, SDGs, uh, which he will, of course, explain during his presentation post-2015. According to him, the change of development delivery systems and governance in India has to define a pragmatic roadmap of decentralization beginning from center to states to district to block and below to that in the every village. So uh, this is a, quite an experienced person who has actually worked in the ground realities, worked with the communities and the defining role which in South Asia should have as a model for the healthcare systems for the community and civil society. I welcome Dr. Omkar Mittal. Please, sir, go ahead with your presentation. Now, I'm sure when Veena asked me for becoming part of this seminar, webinar, she did not know any of these things about me. So I'm still wondering what prompted her to get me onto this. Anyway, I'm thankful to her and to her, to listening to some very knowledgeable presentations from uh, Oklahoma, United States, from uh, South Africa, of Turkey, from Kazakhstan. So I'm really enlightened and I've done quite a lot already from this, uh, this very interesting webinar. Now, coming back to my presentation, you see, you see, it's a very complex issue. And uh, no simplistic views or no final views are possible at this stage. Even WHO is saying that we do not know. And people like us who are not exactly on the same side as WHO are also saying that we do not know. So, so I'll try to uh, present my views in a neutral way. But being more of a street uh, activist than an academician, I may not always adhere to that uh, boundary. So if my co-panelists kind of excuse me if I say something with uh, greater force than I should perhaps say. Now, you see, on uh, 24th of March, when our Prime Minister made the speech to the country announcing the lockout, he said that international agencies have told him that if lockout is not done, millions of people will die. Kindly mark his words. He said millions of people will die. I'll come back to that later, sir. And later on, after two, two extensions of uh, lockout, he said to his political colleagues across the nation that, listen, the post-corona world will not be the same as before. The, it cannot be the, the pre-corona world. So these are the two things which we have to keep in mind when we try to make sense of what has happened in this world for the last four months. I, I happen to know one great uh, erudite person whose name was uh, Professor G. Tobrai. You people uh, in this university of academicians, I'm sure you must have heard his name. He was teaching social science in the Delhi School of Social Economics. And he wrote a very interesting book called European Modernity. If you have not read that book, you must read that book, where he talked about uh, where science has taken from 15th century to the 20th century. And uh, so he told me that, look, the 20th century belonged to the lawyer, but 21st century will belong to the public health person. So when Corona-19 happened, so I realized the wisdom of his words, that how now onwards, the next 50 years will be controlled by public health people. They will decide where the world will go. Our friend uh, Professor Roche has told us a lot about uh, HIV history in South Africa and a person like me has been part of that history. And now again, 
covid conferences in a manner where we right or wrong we like it or not we sometimes may be on the opposite side of the favor in the science debate so now you see the as far as tribal people are concerned it was very interesting to hear the okama gentleman professor vishen and in our country though our we have a massive tribal population of about uh, uh, 10 crores of people at least if not more we have not granted them any sub sovereign rights it was very happening to hear him speak repeatedly on the sovereign rights of the tribal people of america which are being infringed but our constitution doesn't recognize any sovereign rights to the tribal people now as we go further down in the presentation we will understand the implications of that the we the, the tribal people had greater recognition greater recognition of their rights under the british than under the indian constitution and um, uh, the indian government today is talking of saving the forest in a different way but uh, what is coming to reality is that they are trying to consider tribal people as the enemies of the forest and trying to push them out of the forest that is the kind of things which are happening and corona or covid 19 has become a alibi for doing that even further now let me just give you i don't know whether whether you have my presentation in front of you or not i am not very apt with this power putting powerpoint onto the webinar but it doesn't matter i have shared the presentation but maybe it could not be shared with others so Just, just have a look uh, that what is the current status of our COVID uh, pandemic? There are about 22 million cases across the world and 0.8 million deaths. So that's a huge number if you put them all together. And um, though the case fatality rate definition is a bit controversial, but let us say on this basis the case fatality rate is 3.5 percent. So 8 million deaths or 8 lakh deaths is a huge number if you put it all together. Compare that with India. India has had 2.6 million cases and 50,000 deaths, and case fatality rate is 2 percent. Now in UK, interestingly, there there are five countries which uh, WHO has uh, put in the highest uh, incidence of uh, COVID-19, and UK is not one of that. But it is very interesting. To, UK is very important from our point of view. it has got 4 lakh cases and 40000 deaths almost 10% case fatality rate it's a huge huge number i think it could be the highest in the world uk now consider the city of new delhi where i'm sitting there are 1 lakh 50000 cases and 4000 deaths 2.6% of the cases so so just just consider that uh, that uh, the city of delhi right now has had 4000 deaths uh, combined but if you look at madhya pradesh which is a huge big tribal state 20% population is tribal there are only 45000 cases and total deaths are only 1994 of which 600 are deaths in bopal and indore so most of the tribal interland of uh, madhya pradesh is almost free of any death though there are number of cases which is the transmission of virus But deaths are hardly there in the tribal hinterland. State of Jharkhand, there are 22,000 cases, but total deaths are only 234. Chhattisgarh, 50,000 cases, but deaths are only 134. So if you go by mortality figures, not by the disease transmission figures, the tribal population is not really affected by the disease and that. Kindly keep that in mind. In terms of my main, you know, theme of the presentation today, the what is the impact of uh, this corona on the tribals of India? So we now have suggested that the topic today is health. So I should speak on the health of the tribals. The point I'm trying to make is that the tribals are affected in a huge way by COVID-19. But it is not their health which is affected. It is the very survival which is affected. so that is the message that is the main message which is coming from my presentation now very interestingly if we if we talk of health in general not of the tribal kindly note that in uk the average age of people who have died is 85 years 
and also in USA, Italy, the people who are dying are 85 year old people. If you look closely at the Indian data, the average age of persons who are dying is 60 years. Now, 60 years is young people under the definition of WHO. So there is a huge gap. So in our country, while we have we don't have that many deaths, but people who are dying are at a very young age. Now, this is something on which if I if time is left at the end of my presentation, I'll say something more because there seems to be greater interest on the health angle. So let's try to have a little bit of a look at the so one of the previous speaker has already spoken about the history of pandemics, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the 20th century, we have this talk of famous influenza epidemic post First World War in 1920. And that that claims to have uh, caused millions of deaths. It is only in the last 10 or 12 years that they claim to have discovered that it was an avian influenza. Otherwise, we did not know which virus was that. So by very strange method, uh, some kind of archaeological evidence, they have discovered that it was an avian influenza virus. Now, just here, I would like to draw your attention to this very important fact that uh, people are generally thinking that this current uh, COVID-19 pandemic is an influenza pandemic. But WHO has taken not, it has not really made great efforts to, to uh, you know, publicize this fact. They are not saying it is influenza epidemic. They are saying it is a new virus. It is a new coronavirus, COVID-19 epidemic. It is not influenza epidemic. This is causing a lot of mix-up. So if it's a new virus, then they should not make reference to the influenza epidemic, which was the influenza virus. So it is causing a lot of mix-up. Anyway, we had another big one in Asia, which is called Asia, Asiatic flu, which is S5N1. And then 21st century, we had uh, sudden spurt of some new kind of diseases, beginning with the 2003 famous SARS COVID-1 epidemic in China, which caused 8,400 deaths. Now, 8,400 deaths was a big news at that time. Now, we have already heard already 8 lakh deaths. So, there's a big difference. But even in 2003, SARS was a big news. Then we had in 2009, the actual N1 swine flu epidemic, pandemic, and there were a lot of controversies attached to that. In fact, European Parliament passed a resolution against WHO that it is a faked, faked an epidemic. It was never had a pandemic. Similar questions are being raised today by some of the dissenters uh, whom who are not like that. Uh, if they are, they are questioning, is it a pandemic? So similar questions are being raised. But uh, that was the official position of European Parliament in 2009 that unnecessary vaccines were made, unnecessary drugs were purchased, a huge care was made, and the pandemic was never there. That was 2009, as well and one. Now, in 2010 to 2018, we again heard about Ebola, Zika virus, and impending threats of a mutating influenza virus. So, this was something in the air all the time that a new influenza virus is going to attack the people. And what came in 2020 was not an influenza virus, but it was a new coronavirus. And this is what we are discussing today. So that is the kind of, uh, you know, background picture we have where we have had a constant set of... Our friend from Okam has already talked of uh, the, uh, the bio-terrorist kind of attack on the tribal people of America by the uh, Europeans and how it caused a total devastation. So this whole issue is being discussed in the context of a biological warfare also today. Some mention has already already been made of, you know, China versus America, etc. Et so the stock of biological warfare is already in the air. So what are the issues which I want to raise in this background information which I have given you. So one issue I already mentioned is that whether we are facing a pandemic or not. And I have already shown that in some parts of India, which is huge population of millions of people, there is hardly any death from and hardly any disease. So these people are wondering what is happening. They are saying it is nothing. So their life is disappeared. I will come to that. So there is a big debate on what is the definition of pandemic and 
WHO has a very ambivalent kind of uh, position in that. What is a pandemic? What is not a pandemic? Etc. Etc. So we should, uh, as academicians, should have a, a closer eye and closer focus on what do they mean by a pandemic and what do we mean by pandemic. And so this uh, formulation, which was given in 2009 by official European Parliament, that under the influence of global pharmaceutical industry and Bill Gates, WHO faked, a, faked an epidemic is being repeated today in some quarters, whether you agree or disagree, is the issue for the debate. Secondly, within, within this pandemic issue, there is something we call epidemiological triad. There is a host, which is we human being or maybe animals. Then there is a uh, agent, which is the virus. And then there is environment. Now, it is very, very important to consider the environment. Like I said, in tribal areas of India, people are hardly having any disease. While in the urban areas, there is a huge number of diseases. So, all this talk of COVID-19 and pandemic, etc., etc., we are not segregating it by the habitat. We are not segregating which are the population actually being affected. Like I said, in India, younger people are getting affected. In US or UK, it is the populations living in the nursing home, the old people who are dying. So, we can't, can we really call it one single epidemic? In fact, there's reports from WHO that there are perhaps five or six different viruses floating. Some are of greater virulence and some are of lesser virulence. So this is something which must come in the public domain. That maybe we are not facing one virus, but six different viruses. And the planning, the response, the preparedness has to be different from each, each one of that. Now, so when uh, we say epidemic, by the very use of epidemic is very frightening. It appears that a lot of people are get, going to get sick, a lot of people are going to die. And when you say pandemic, it means epidemic which is happening in several parts of the world. Almost the entire world is engulfed with that. However, when WHO uses the word epidemic, it doesn't mean the severity of the disease. It could be a very mild thing which, which is happening. So we have to keep that into mind that Epidemic doesn't mean a very severe disease or death. It could be just, so there are two sides of it. One is the transmission of virus, which can be symptomless. You must have heard in regarding that COVID-19 that it, it, the spread could be asymptomatic. People may not have any symptom at all or may have very mild symptoms. So the response to such an entity has to be proportioned to the danger or risk being faced by the human being. And if you make a disproportionate response, then naturally political questions arise that what is your motivation for making a disproportionate response to a, of course, some people think that it is a very, very serious disease and et cetera, and if you don't take it seriously, then humanity is a danger and people who are questioning it are not serious people. That is an ideological issue. I'm not going to that. All I'm saying is that when we are talking about epidemic, we have to keep in mind that it, it may not really be killing. It may not even be causing, causing a serious disease. So specifically in context of India, we have two institutions. One is called the National Disease Surveillance Program. It is stationed in New Delhi at Baba Shamnath Marg. It is a task to maintain a data for the prevalence of, let us say, flu symptoms over the last three or four or five years. Now, that data has never been presented to the country that in last year or year before last and or year before that, how many people actually suffered the flu symptoms and how many people, how many people died. So today, when, let us say, in India, the 50,000 cases have died or, you know, any number of cases have taken place of disease. We, we have nothing to compare. They are not putting forward the data. Similarly, the National Institute of Virology, Pune, is doing the, the virological testing. So we have no clear correlation between a virus which is transmitting and the disease which is causing. So this is one of the major issues which is confronting us today. So we don't have a kind of an epidemiological model of transmission of this pandemic in India as of today, at least not to my knowledge. Now, my main point, as I said earlier, is the impact of uh, this uh, uh, this so-called pandemic on the tribals and their health and livelihood. Now, I've already said about health. I'm afraid there's nothing more to say about this. There is hardly any disease in tribal areas. There are hardly any deaths in tribal areas. What is there is the total attack on the livelihoods of the tribal people. 
Now, first part is that a large number of young tribal people are now migrating. We have all heard of this crisis of migration. So, tribal people, younger age particularly, is migrating to cities in search of jobs and earning their livelihood. And they have been forced to go back. Their livelihood is severely affected. So, if there is one thing which is hit them most, is this reverse migration. And as of today, in the last four months, no redressal is available for these migrants who have returned. This is a major part of the tribal society, especially the younger ones. And they are now linked to the urban economy. They are not the tribals in the traditional sense of the tribals, as said earlier. Secondly, the free movement of people has been stopped. There is a huge amount of police hijackness. So the whole life of tribal people has been disrupted. And uh, given their total dis political disempowerment, lack of leadership, they have no way to fight the system. That is a big, big, big problem. Thirdly, the livelihood is related to non-agricultural rural vocations. So they are engaged in a lot of, you know, small trades and other kind of activities. So what the government has done is that it is not allowing the people to move. The traditional markets, which are the hearts, have been stopped. So they used to make small, small things from the forest and they used to bring to the heart. And even if they did not earn anything, it was part of their lifestyle. So their entire lifestyle has been disrupted. I mean, this is, these are serious things which are happening and there is no, as you say in India, survive. Or you people say advocacy, there is nobody advocating for them, there is nobody raising their voice. And if government is providing only rice in the ration, this is not sufficient. They can't survive just by rice. And their livelihoods and lifestyles being disrupted. And so, the other things which have happened in the last four months is that we have this uh, amendment to Environmental Impact Assessment Act and people are afraid that whatever little production was there for the new projects into the tribal lands will be taken away. So the question, the Coal Mines Act has been amended, so there will be more and more private coal mining. And the question to be raised for my presentation here is that why the state is not sensitive to the vulnerability of tribal livelihoods? And why is it crushing them so ruthlessly in the last four months? Is it by default or is it deliberate? Is there a design to, to push the tribals out of forest on their way of life and bring them on the roadside? That is the key question which is confronting us. Now, in terms of coming back to health again, as I said earlier, if we literally go into the statistics of people who are dying, let's say, let's say, as they say that, let's say 100 people have got disease transmission, they are corona positive. Out of that, 85 people will be symptom Now, out of those 15, some three or four will die and other other 15 will have some amount of sickness. So the question is arising that how many people are there who have comorbidity? They have diabetes, they have heart attack. Lot of the celebrities which are dying are dying because of comorbidity. I mean, lot of our doctor friends have died. So either they have a stent in their heart or they have diabetes which is uncontrolled. So it is sad our, our uh, our soil uh, you know, finance minister died primarily because of diabetes at a young age. Our health and foreign minister died of primarily because of diabetes at a young age. So if in this country, which is famous for its medical, you know, past, where there's a lot of international tourism, people come here for getting treatment. If our own top dignitaries, that is not being managed well. If all our heart doctors have strength in their own heart, how will they protect the health of the rest of the people of the country? It's a very serious, serious issue. So let us say that of the people who are dying, at least there are 50% who are dying of the comorbidity. But to be very fair, there are another 50% who don't have any comorbidity. comorbidity. Some, you get, a, you get to hear a story that somebody died, suddenly people are dying. They had no previous disease. So this is a bit of a mystery which is attached to this disease which is happening, whatever it is, I'm not saying that it is not a pandemic or it is a pandemic. If there is a, if there is a five cases of a new disease, with WHO definition, five, five cases you can call an epidemic. 
So I'm not questioning their technical definition. And it is it is possible that some people are dying without any previous illness. The question comes, are they dying of fear or are they dying of something else? The fear is a huge phenomena which WHO has uh, ignored. We have written a letter to the WHO Director General saying that please take fear into confidence. The entire society is filled with fear. And fear also kills. Now, this is something which has not been taken into confidence. This was also the case in the HIV era. Kindly keep that in mind. A lot of people died because they were told you have HIV and they died. So this aspect of uh, epidemic has not been kept into mind. So I, the last part I want to say today is that it was a great mystery why people were dying. Uh, initially, they thought that people were dying of pneumonia. Then they realized that people are not dying of pneumonia. It is a kind of situation where it is not the virus which is killing. What is killing is the immune response of our own body, which is called cytokine storm. So cytokine storm is leading to destruction of the anticoagulation factor, which leads to various thrombosis, and which is what causes the deposition into the lungs, and which is what causes the anoxia and hypoxia, and this is how the person dies. So slowly, slowly, the doctor community has realized and it has amended the way it is managing the patient. However, WHO, when it, is, it has given a call for lockdown, they said the lockdown is not to contain the epidemic, but it is to prepare ourselves for building up our you know, health services. But last four months, our health services have not been built. Our doctors are demoralized. The hospitals, which are not so well equipped, are, are not so well equipped even now. So the corona epidemic has caused the biggest crisis of the health services of this country. And we will have to completely rethink how we will rebuild our health services, how we will rebuild the confidence of our people into our health services, the confidence of doctor in himself, confidence of the people of the country in the, uh, in the doctor. So this latest initiative which has come, the digital health card, this I am afraid it is not going to solve this problem. And the medical world, the health world is in a very deep crisis. And people are in a very deep crisis. Uh, the academician sitting at your university, Vinaji, other people have participated in other parts of the globe. This is my last point for today. We have to think anew. The previous solutions will not work. Whatever our prime minister meant when he, when he told his politicians that the world is going to have changed, don't think of the older world. So this is a message to the civil society also. Don't think of the older solutions. Be skeptical of the pronouncements of these international donor development agencies, but if they are right, then go along with them also. So don't take a position. And um, so this is what I have to say. The tribal, my my, I spent some amount of years of my life with the tribal people. We don't recognize their sovereignty. We don't recognize the right of their to to their own land. You destroy their forests. We destroy the rivers. And this appears to be another instance of destruction of their livelihoods through the means of COVID. I am not accusing anybody, but this is where the system is moving. So thank you very much. Here I stop. And if there are any questions, I'll come to that later. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Mittal. It was wonderful. And uh, as uh, already um, previous three speakers have spoken about different dynamics of health and politics, you brought it even more uh, in a different dynamics. Uh, regarding one small thing that you always wanted to know why I'm doing this, uh, as you know, uh, Haripriya is one of my co-project person. So actually, this is part of a bigger project we all are doing. Haripriya is looking into urban health and diabetes issues. There's another friend of ours. Uh, she's looking into uh, mental health systems. And actually, in this project, I'm looking into indigeneity and health crisis where mainly I'm looking into mental health uh, services. But right now, because of pandemic, as you say, the whole idea of comorbidity and the complexity of the health services, how it affects the societies at large. So I'm looking into this uh, dynamics of health services among the indigenous communities in the western part of India. And also another project which I have is with the Native Americans, uh, where, um, of course, um, actually it's not a project, it's a long-term um, writing project I'm do, doing with a few more colleagues where we are looking into the indigeneity and idea, uh, their healing practices, their environmental practices and how it is all 
connected together so the so this pro, this seminar is not something just because everybody is doing a covid thing so we are also doing a covid it's not for that matter we actually uh, planned uh, i when i was working with it i actually planned it with hari priya and uh, with consent of dr hari priya we did it under this project which we already have under welcome trust so uh, this is the objective of the project that we have to uh, look into several dynamics which are affecting the south asian health systems uh so because of that we are doing it so now i um, give again uh, the podium of course not podium the uh, the virtual space to uh, hari priya dr hari priya to um, further uh, progress this discussion yes uh thank excuse me uh thank you beena um and thank you dr mittal for raising um some of the very important issues that we do need to consider about uh, a how a pandemic is defined who gets to define it and uh, you know how several governments have to follow these definitions um but also more pertinent to india your questions about um you know the, the how uh, to what extent this pandemic has affected uh, indigenous peoples and uh, how do we know and whether the numbers are high the numbers are low there is a lot of discussion about these numbers um last week i think there was an article in the hindu uh, by two scholars who calculated the death rate you know because a number of deaths in india are not registered to i think apparently only some 26 27% uh, of deaths in india are registered officially so most times you uh, you don't know whether uh, somebody has died of disease x or y or whatever so then how do we calculate number of deaths due to this or due to that whether they have been tested whether they died after the test or before the test so there is a lot of discussion in the indian media about these things and um, then added to this um uh, is the dis uh, discussion or the debate about to what extent this disease is prevalent among the indigenous populations and that is another level of um, uh, mystery i suppose that we have to uh, deal with as of now in india because apparently we have still not reached the peak here as as we speak uh, we still have uh, a month or maybe couple of more months to go before we reach the peak and then we will know what the fallout is but you are right to uh point us uh, to think more about these labels and uh, definitions and who gets to define them etc but also in common with all the other papers that have been presented uh, one point one question i feel uh, emerging from your presentation is um you know is it right to then leave uh the indigenous groups uh to themselves you know leave them to their land and their uh, area and not talk about this uh, phrase called development which is always assumed to be about connecting roads bringing electricity water or whatever but it can also bring in new diseases and new kinds of uh, 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 problems to these populations which are otherwise isolated i don't think there is an easy answer to it um and this is something we keep asking in our classes also but i think your uh, discussion points more to that what have how are we to deal with indigenous populations uh, because indigenous populations from what i know i've heard in telangana at least in interior districts um of telangana maternal mortality rate for instance is very high among some of the indigenous populations then what do you do do you take health care to them or you just let them be um you know so these are i think difficult questions uh to deal with and i think your paper points to that so with this abina i will stop here i've already raised some points so i would now uh, like the presenters to take it further yeah definitely thank you aripriya for 
uh, summing up different discussions and especially presentation of Dr. Mithal. Uh, I think uh, let's go from uh, the first presentation itself because now uh, Professor Beeson can come. Uh, uh, there were certain questions which were raised by you. And I am sorry, Bina, I just have to say, though, I have a small child, so I'll have to leave at 10 o'clock. You know, I have no, to no, start no. shooting it all. I have to go to bed. So I will leave at 10. So please excuse me for that. So we'll try to sum up before that because all these uh, other people also have their chickens. Yeah. Yeah, sure. so I'll be at 10. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So uh, let's begin with Professor Beeson and uh, he can, uh, uh, whatever questions you discuss, uh, raised with, yeah, Professor Beeson, you're already there, so please answer them. Well, sorry, what was that? You broke up. I couldn't hear you. Uh, no, I was just saying that uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, Dr. Haripriya had asked you certain questions uh, while discussing your paper or your presentation. So um, if we can uh, relook to those questions again. Uh, she was talking about uh, one very important aspect that how you consider how you um, how you believe what is going to be what you uh, what you do when you get um, the change in the rituals and how you reconcile with the change so how cultural um, transition due to covid is being understood or um, been taken into consideration or how it is being debated by the indigenous indigenous community in the United States for now, because lots of things have changed in the rituals and um, even in the mm -hmm. um, way things are going on in the uh, traditional lifestyle. Yeah, I think that the uh, um, we kind of still are figuring that out. In terms of what. Um, e will occur. I feel like um, there's a lot of um, kind of a feeling of being a precariousness that we're not sure how it's going to play out in the years to come with uh, traditional ceremonies and spirituality. I feel like there's uh, um, there's this feeling that Well, once a vaccination is available, if that's the case, and I feel like as ceremonies go, um, um, in terms of just because of colonization brought Christianization, and um, a lot of our communities ended up altering uh, ceremonies because. They were uh, by uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs or uh, government agents who were trying to uh, suppress Native uh, ceremonies. So we've always had to adapt and change to these outside forces. And I think this, is, this isn't any different, but it's kind of like why... Um, we're in this generation now where we're going to have to figure out a way to continue on with our ceremonies and teachings with a restrictive environment and trying to use, I guess, the technology that's available now. And I think there's a um, important, there's an importance in uh, taking care of uh, elders who have a lot of knowledge and trying to document that knowledge and trying to um, understand it so that it gets passed down to the next generations because that's the only way the knowledge will continue is if younger people are learning. Um, but if this COVID is increasing the uh, chances of elders passing away, then the question becomes how do we um, ensure that they are uh, the ability for them to pass down knowledge. We're kind of at a um, you know a turning point or uh, something we the current generation hasn't really had to deal with before, 
and we're having to deal with a lot of things that our previous ancestors had to. And I think ultimately we'll be okay. Um, I just think that if we make adjustments, you know, how does that ultimately the, we'll always have the intent, whether it's, you know, whether we don't pass a pipe or share water. Um, but the importance is that we're still maintaining a sincerity in our prayers and maintaining sincerity um, in the sanctity of what we're doing. Um, I think as long as our, some of the stuff that we normally do, if it's altered, then, you know, it, it uh, it'll still be okay. Um, you know, one of the things too, that I look at is like, uh, we've already adjusted to many things today, uh, that they didn't used to do in the past. Like sometimes people will try to be really super traditional and, you know, they, if we're going to make a fire to think you don't have to use a lighter, <laughs> But we'll use a lighter, <laughs> like a, a regular, you know, lighter and matches and things like that to get it going. Or um, traditionally, they used to use like buffalo hides to cover a sweat lodge. But today we just use like um, like canvas tarps and blankets. <laughs> so we've, you know, always adjusted to these things. But the intent is always there. So whatever we do, it, I, I feel like as long as the intention is sincere, it'll be okay. It'll be fine. You know, that's kind of what my feelings are on that. Yeah, 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 that explains it. And you are, um, you are right that um, people have always improvised and people have always been creative um, about religion, ritual and things like that. What is interesting is how sometimes that gets lost, that it is assumed that tradition is something, you know, which is crystallized and fossilized, but actually tradition is dynamic. Traditions are always invented, mm. you know, yeah. um, and it is very important to emphasize that um, when we talk about uh, a lot of things and not assume that there is no scope at all for um, changing or improvising uh, what we do. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Anybody? Have a question? From anyone else? Yeah. I mean, the floor is now open, basically. We yeah. are just, or if everybody would want to just respond uh, and then want to have a larger discussion, that is fine too. Yeah, we have time. So we can. Yeah, we have time. We have time. We have around uh, more or less 30 minutes. Yeah. So it will be interesting if there are uh, some uh, uh, can, can, I, can I ask Professor Beeson? Yeah, definitely. With your permission. Yes, yes. Uh, very, 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 I heard you intently, Professor Beeson, and I, I think I understood what you're saying. That's a very important uh, thing that you said about adjusting with the new reality. But uh, something on which I'm very keen from Indian point of view, that, let me say my Indian point of view is that you tell us a little bit more about your sovereign relationship with the government of the United States. How does it work? Because in India, the government of India doesn't allow any kind of, you know, even a separate entity. So there is there's, 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 there's something in the constitution, but it is only notional. We don't recognize sub-sovereign rights of the tribal people in India, which are huge in number. So would you like to explain a little bit and give a message to the tribal people of India for a global perspective, if only only if you wish? Oh. Well, I, uh, you I broke up on that last part. Yeah, um, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Mittal, uh, can you rephrase it once again, a little shorter, because, you know, there is a little lag in the technology, so he could not get your question properly. So, no, can you... My first question is, no, first question you. Is, can, you, can you explain a little bit more about your sovereign relationship with the government of the United States? 
Okay. That's one one part of the question. Part, okay. And, second part. And, and second part, I, part is, do you have a message to give to the tribal people of India in terms of global sovereignty? What they should do for their okay, own that's, for that's the people right. of uh, yeah. Definitely. Okay, uh, so uh, Professor Beeson, actually, uh, this is a very big um, dynamic uh, difference between indigeneity in India and indigeneity in Native America. Because uh, the idea of sovereignty uh, is uh, very different from uh, the way mm -hmm. it is seen in the United States. In India, the sovereignty of an indigenous community is confined to the idea of fifth and sixth schedule. That is only the territorial right. Uh, but uh, if you, um, uh, Dr. Bittle, actually, I would like to, um, this is actually altogether a different debate, you know, because in uh, India, we have uh, two ideas, indigenous and tribal identity. So we believe that everybody in India is indigenous and the communities which have territorial um, rights since ages together, they have not moved out of their territorial region. They have an idea of, uh, they have the constitutional uh, benefit of fifth and sixth schedule, where they have the right to rule uh, in their particular territory through cultural and uh, constitutional means. Okay, so this is the basic difference between Indian uh, indigenous communities. Uh, we don't even call them indigenous because the terminology of indigenous doesn't apply to India. Uh, the terminology which is used in India is scheduled tribe. They are considered as scheduled tribe because they live in a scheduled territory, which even though they are just like any other indigenous Indians, they have the sovereignty in terms of the territorial region, but the applicability of the constitution is there in their territories which actually functions even in United States. Actually, uh, you know, Dr. Beeson, we have to uh, this particular aspects need to be taught to many of the students and even academicians because this is the basic constitutional um, I would say it's like uh, it's still not there in the academic debate on a global level and especially in the South Asian Academia uh, this is uh, this need to be uh, discussed on a very different uh, plinth uh, because America is still under the colonial settler uh, system uh, if we will say that America or United States is a fully independent nation, then it is not. Because the indigenous communities of United States of America still don't own the equal constitutional rights. Because they are living a nation within a nation. On the contrary, India is owned by the people of India. Therefore, this problem doesn't exist. So actually, um, uh, when you were, uh, actually, Professor Beeson, when we were talking about the sovereignty issues and broken, uh, broken treaties, um, uh, this issue is uh, more in context of um, United States uh, and the Native American nations within. Uh, this uh, doesn't apply to India because now India is ruled by Indians themselves. Uh, so this is uh, was actually the question which uh, Professor Mittal wanted to ask. So um, uh, I would have... I, this, is, this is your version of what I said. I have not said that, but anyway, please continue. Uh, yeah, so now uh, whatever... Uh, so this is what um, he's, try, he's asking about, that uh, how the sovereignty issues of Native Americans is different from sovereignty of in, uh, tribal communities of India. So mm -hmm. uh, you may like to answer him... Uh, with your perceptions of South Asian politics and Native American politics. And well, here that um, uh, uh, we, we, even though we have, um, we still maintain certain parts of our land base and um, we do have certain in, uh, inherent rights and treaty rights we're still, um, we're still kind of uh, ruled over or by the United States government. We are unable to exercise uh, greater sovereignty because the government holds a certain uh, plenary power over tribal nations. Um, so at any time, there's always a possibility that the government can um, it, it, 
obligations and rights or obligations and responsibilities to Native people. Cool. Um, I think, um, you know, we're always going to have these issues with uh, the U.S. government trying to dominate, you know, our uh, affairs and not only the government, but the states, individual states always try to um, en enroach on tribal sovereignty and they want to apply colonial laws to um, native communities. And it's always a struggle that we're always having to deal with as uh, tribal communities. Um, and I also think that uh, we need to maintain who we are regardless of whatever um, colonial governments or whatever tribal governments we fall under. We need to ensure our traditional ways because ultimately that's who we are. And I feel like um, what, what uh, he was asking in terms of a, a message of solidarity that, yeah, that you know, we should always um, strive to overcome colonization and maintain our traditions and support each other and recognize each other's uh, inherent rights to be who we are as uh, indigenous people, native people, um, wherever, wherever we're at. And, um, you know, to recognize our common challenges with colonial governments and support each other with, you know, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and creating uh, networking and communicating um, in the spirit of solidarity so that we're, uh, you know, we can um, make sure that we're uh, kind of like and start treating ourselves as sovereign people and maintaining those relationships Uh, without them the right to do that, that if we wanted to uh, create and organize with uh, people in India or anywhere, that we have a right to do that. So. We'd ask Vida to coordinate that. <laughs> no, you, you can right. comment on whatever you feel, <laughs> you, you, whatever you feel like. No, no, we you, you ask you to coordinate. No. no, my question, um, uh, I hope you understood whatever, like uh, you could get into whatever he said. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Professor Beeson, you could answer to whatever um, query and whatever doubts about the native rights uh, we have in India or in America, United States. Uh, you could answer to the question of Omkar, Professor Mittal. I hope, uh, Professor Mittal, uh, you could get the answers to whatever questions you had. I got the message with, with this point that you should coordinate in future between the sovereign nation, sovereign nation of uh, indigenous nation of America and people of tribals of India. Actually, this whole debate is not only going in India and United States, it's going all over the world. The whole indigeneity is united now and they're already working in India. I need not to lead anything. There are many leaders already. <laughs> let's, let's leaders do their job. We are just taking into consideration what the leaders are doing. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beeson. It was really um, uh, a good, uh, smart, uh, it's, it's really an analytical answer. Uh, if uh, somebody else has a comment on what uh, Professor Beeson has to say, Roche or Firoz, if you would like to comment on that. Um, I, I actually have a question um, because I, one of the uh, courses that I teach at my school is American history. And my question to you would be that for those of us who are who are not native to the countries where we, where we were born. How can we understand the importance of what it means to be, to, to, to be, like, why retain your traditional beliefs and practices in the face of modernity? I think, uh, Rishi, can you reframe the question once again? Because uh, there is a lag, so he could not get it. 
for, for those of us who, who are not indigenous to uh, to our countries, I, I'm very clearly not, I, I don't have a thousand year heritage in South Africa, but what is, why retain the traditional beliefs and practices in the face of modernity? Mm-hmm. Why maintain them? Uh, um, yes. Well, because I think that um, ultimately those ways and beliefs are what um, center us, our original teachings, and it's who we are and it's who we um, strive to be, the teachings of our ancestors. and our relatives and you know it could it's very it's a very fragile you know state it's a very fragile thing so if that were to go away we would still have our traditions we would still have our uh, uh, ways of life and that it's basically what what grounds us and that's our role and purpose in this on this earth and i think within this uh environment is to maintain our um spiritual identity and traditions um because that's that's ultimately who we are like each different tribal nation has certain ceremonies and protocols that should be followed and um our identity our very identity is tied up in those uh ceremonies and traditions and if we if we cease being who we are, whether as Osage or Lakotas or Navajos, um, you know those that's pretty much the the essence of our of our being. And to give that up, you know, for it's it's a hard thing because you gotta you have to uh, um, kind of walk in two worlds. Of one, you gotta go to a regular job and do things and you know pay bills, and then on the other hand, you're trying to maintain your Uh, traditional I think that's the thing is like if we don't maintain that then we'll just be like a lot of other people who don't have that identity and all we'll have is football games and you know (laughs) uh, you know movies and stuff like that and it's you know and that and and sadly that's all a lot of people have is that's what their culture is we were just talking talking about this yesterday with my wife in modern society, modern, you know, that's all people have is we're going to go shopping and we're going to go do this and we're going to go to the movies and that's all they got. Whereas we have our dances and we have our language and we have our traditional ceremonies and spirituality. And that's something that we, that is very important, even though the government have tried to um, take that away we still were able to maintain those. Um, so if we, if we give that up, then we're just going to be like everyone else and not have an identity. And that's really the core of our identity is our spirituality and our traditions and culture. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I think it does because, you know, um, when, when, when you touch upon how your traditions, your, beliefs make you who you are um you know it it is something that universally i think people should be able to relate to you know we are all proud of 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 being where we are from you know our our food our our traditions our 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 football teams um and i think that we, we tend to overlook the importance of of our background when we are confronted with, as you say, you know, going shopping or, you know, listening to the latest uh, latest hits on Spotify, I think it's called. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think I'm not very tech savvy. I still buy songs on iTunes. <laughs> um, I, um, I think that it can help us to to make sense of a lot of other colonial 
enterprises in, in the world at the moment, which we are being made to look at through our European eyes or our Western eyes. Um, so thank you for, for your honest and straightforward answer. Much, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, Roshay, now you can, uh, because uh, Dr. Haripriya had asked certain questions to you as well. So could you uh, answer them as well? And we really have to take care of our daughter's demand because she's already coming. I will, I will keep it brief. Yeah, um, no, no, you, you, you actually, I'm really, uh, I have to apologize because I kept on making you be brief in your presentation as well. So I think uh, you, uh, I hope you have the question because the question was asked um, by us. Yes, the, the question was about you know the the impact of uh, vaccine nationalism um, in in the future content of uh, a world with a diminished World Health Organization. Um, and it's it's I, I would like to answer it in, with with two goes. One is you know we already see uh, the the future of uh, of uh, um, of a nationalist approach in that America a couple of months ago had an air, airplane, uh, I, I'm not sure, I think it was somewhere in, in Asia, Hong Kong or, or Bangkok perhaps. The aircraft was already taxiing when America in, uh, just basically took the, the consignment of protective equipment which was based in for Germany. And the plane took off from, from Bangkok or Hong Kong and instead of going to Germany, it, it went to America. Um, so there is definitely a future where you know unilateralism and nationalism is going to make it difficult for us to effectively combat um, uh, pandemics. The second side of of the answer is that we, our, our political beliefs tend to influence how we respond to. Um, to, to pandemics and to, to advice, medical advice as well. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the, um, uh, of the instance in France uh, many years ago where the, uh, the country was so divided about whether to adopt uh, the, the vaccination um, for, um, for swine flu, I think it was, that uh, the, the country was divided by, the, by politicians People became divided among uh, by by their factions, and in the end, only eight percent of people ended up taking the, uh, the the vaccination. Obviously, that set uh, left France open to a, a resurgence of of the disease, but it also opened up a debate about whether vaccinations serve a purpose. And France is now among the most fervently anti-vax nations in Europe. So. Introducing politics in, into um, the future of, of vaccinations is, in my opinion, a recipe for disaster. And I, I would like to actually just quote uh, very briefly from uh, the declaration that the U.S. Congress passed when it endorsed the creation of the WHO. And it's, it says, particularly in our shrinking world, the spread of disease via airplane or other swift transport across national boundaries gives rise to ever-present danger. Thus, to protect ourselves, we must help wipe out disease everywhere. The records of our export trade show that countries with relatively high living standards buy most of our goods. If the rest of the world continues in, in, health, in ill health and abject poverty, our own economy will suffer. That, that's 1945. <laughs> it's... it's 75 years later, do we have to relearn this lesson? Um, you know, COVID-19 is sending a bill of $15 trillion. You know, it's an expensive lesson to want to learn a second time round. So, you know, for, for the sake of the future, let us hope that, you know, politicians see, see sense and don't go down the road of uh, in, inducing nationalism in, in terms of uh, the vaccination and, and global health process. Dina, you're, Dina, you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just have to, um, uh, so I think like uh, Russia gave the right... Uh, whatever you asked for, he gave really insightful uh, 
Uh, yeah. uh, so now we are left with uh, Dr. F uh, Mr. Firoz. Mr. Firoz Barotev, if you are there. Yeah, yeah. hi. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so I, I will uh, provide my uh, answer very briefly. Uh, uh, regarding your uh, question, uh, how the people dealing with this situation, um, just I want to say that uh, Tajik, uh, Tajikistan, uh, like uh, science collapsing uh, USSR, uh, and uh, when we had a civil war, uh, like um, feeling crisis, uh, we are in economic crisis and we had a lot of social challenges uh, and the people used to uh, live somehow uh, independently, like to solve the issues uh, without uh, like, you know, without getting special or like support from governments. So in a case of the COVID-19 also, it was easy to uh, like, you know, to see that uh, when uh, in, the, in the country was a panic and uh, like, you know, when they saw through the news uh, uh, about the situation, uh, they, uh, about the situation in other countries, they start their own preparation. They start, the people start you know, buying antibiotics, uh, start buying medicine, start uh, like, you know, uh, saving food. So uh, they, uh, people almost know that if something bad happening, they, uh, they, like, you know, they should uh, take care mostly about themselves than to get uh, like, you know, other supports, uh, like uh, social support from a government. So this kind of immunity help, uh, like, uh, again, uh, worked uh, during COVID-19 and people start to uh, their own preparation. And uh, during the quarantine also was clear that uh, people used the uh, medicines which they bought uh, in a cheaper price because uh, why the people start preparing themselves uh, usually in Tajikistan uh, uh, before holidays or uh, if something happening like uh, like uh, when the panic in society the prices is go raising high so going up and people uh, just to save money they're trying to uh, make preparation early and about getting information, uh, unfortunately, people uh, in uh, rural areas, they are under influence of uh, state media because they, have, uh, they don't have other opportunities. But people who live in the cities, uh, they, are, uh, they, have, uh, they have a chance to get uh, different information than state media. So uh, they uh, can um, like, uh, get uh, more real uh, information from social social media and independent media and uh, unfortunately uh, independent journalists uh, they are the self-censorship among independent journalists uh, it's very high but um, they also like you not know, trying to survive and uh, wo uh, like uh, trying to do their job and also at the same time trying to be uh, safe. Uh, for example, in a uh, case of the death of uh, the author of National uh, Song of Tajikistan, um, everybody know that he died from coronavirus, but the media trying to say that uh, he was uh, hospitalized with the symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, so the media also trying to be careful in this situation. So uh, like, um, I think that uh, in uh, regarding COVID-19, also like uh, uh, mostly people trying to uh, like to trying to solve the issue themselves. Because uh, as um, uh, for example in the United States, um, I uh, saw that the government provide uh, each to the each single citizens or uh, green card holders uh, like you no know, financial uh, help, social help, and they. Uh, provide a different kind of social helps to the people, but uh, Tajik people say, uh, like Tajik citizens, they didn't get such of supports. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay, interesting. Hmm? <laughs> Indeed. Everywhere, uh, one, which is also thing. Very... Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Yes. One thing regarding the traditions, uh, and for, uh, like in Tajikistan also, it's difficult to uh, control, like you not know, difficult to ask people to um, like to limit themselves for not doing traditions. Uh, 
for example, uh, the government recommend uh, people uh, do not celebrate uh, two uh, like religious uh, holidays like Eid Qurban and Eid Ramadan. Uh, but um, in reality, we saw that uh, like people, anyways, they celebrated. Then the market was full of people. They bought uh, like you no know, food. They prepared the tables like duster hands to host the people to treat the, uh, the others and uh, the neighbors the relatives and also in tajikistan it's very good tradition that if somebody have a loss so the relatives and neighbors they feel responsibility to come and to uh, to say good words so during the pandemic was people feel uh, like you no know, uh, uncomfortability they didn't know to go or do not go but when the it was happened uh, for example, this year I uh, lost my father and my family didn't know what to do with these traditions because uh, like according of traditions, we should prepare the tables and uh, should be prepared for hosting a lot of people. But what we did, uh, so we anyway prepared the tables uh, but, and what's happened, the people anyway came during the quarantine. So uh, the people... People like uh, it's kind of the conflict between now the people feel a conflict between the traditions to follow traditions or to like no uh, to keep uh, to be in a quarantine. Well, sorry like to hear this. about your father, but yeah, I mean, I think this confusion is probably pervasive across the world. Um, what do you do? Uh, how much can you cut down? You know, some things you cannot cut down at all, uh, and some you can. Um, you know, like uh, here in Hyderabad, we read in the papers about how for um, what we call as Bakrid, Eid Kurban, uh, uh, instead of people going to the market and buying the goats and then sacrificing and then giving it back, apparently there was some e trade something online where you can book a goat and uh, then that uh, somebody will sell it and it will be sacrificed and the meat will be sent so you know you know it is still your goat that you sacrificed except you never saw it yeah. it was all done digitally yeah, this is good. It's good. It's good to send the meat then to, to picture of the meat yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> in the future uh, maybe Maybe yeah, and I this. think, you know, that also shows uh, another side of using the media, um, you know, so while the governments do what they do and uh, big bodies, international bodies have to do what they do, people also do what they uh, have to do, no? Uh, that is also there. Yeah, uh, Bina, it is almost, uh, I will have to... Uh, yeah, thank you all. Uh, you know, we will just wind up now, and uh, it was wonderful to have you all. And thanks again. It was uh, a great session, and I'll be preparing a report. And you, if you want, you all can tell us. So we will edit the certain portions and send to you as well. Thanks a lot, and it was great having you, you all. Again. Thank thanks you all. I absolutely really enjoyed. I'm sorry I can't spend more time on this. Oh, no, it's yeah? okay. Okay.